It gives me the keenest pleasure to announce on behalf of my employer, Mr. Bertram Wooster of Barclay Mansions, London W1, that Audio Partners proudly present My Man Jeeves by P.G. Woodhouse Read by Martin Jarvis The first story is entitled Bertie Changes His Mind. It has happened so frequently in the past few years that young fellows starting in my profession have come to me for a word of advice that I have found it convenient now to condense my system into a brief formula. Resource and tact. That is my motto. Tact, of course, has always been with me a sine qua non, while as for resource, I think I may say that I have usually contrived to show a certain modicum of what I might call finesse in handling those little contretemps which inevitably arise from time to time in the daily life of a gentleman's personal gentleman. I am reminded, by way of an instance, of the episode of the School for Young Ladies near Brighton an affair which I think may be said to have commenced one evening at the moment when I brought Mr. Wooster his whiskey and siphon, and he addressed me with such remarkable petulance. Not a little moody Mr. Wooster had been for some days, far from his usual bright self. This I had attributed to the natural reaction from a slight attack of influenza from which he had been suffering, and of course took no notice, merely performing my duties as usual until, on the evening of which I speak, he exhibited this remarkable petulance when I brought him his whisky and siphon. "'Oh, dash it, Jeeves,' he said, manifestly overwrought. "'I wish at least you'd put it on another table for a change.' "'Sir?' I said. "'Every night, dash it all,' proceeded Mr. Wooster morosely. "'You come in at exactly the same old time, with the same old tray, and put it on the same old table.' I'm fed up, I tell you. It's the bally monotony of it that makes it all seem so frightfully bally. I confess that his words filled me with a certain apprehension. I had heard gentlemen in whose employment I have been speak in very much the same way before, and it had almost invariably meant that they were contemplating matrimony. It disturbed me, therefore, I am free to admit, when Mr. Wooster addressed me in this fashion. I had no desire to sever a connection so pleasant in every respect as his and mine had been, and my experience is that when the wife comes in at the front door, the valet of bachelor days goes out at the back. "'It's not your fault, of course,' went on Mr. Wooster, regaining a certain degree of composure. "'I'm not blaming you, but, by Jove, I mean, you must acknowledge, I mean to say, I've been thinking pretty deeply these last few days, Jeeves.' and I've come to the conclusion mine is an empty life. I'm lonely, Jeeves. You have a great many friends, sir. What's the good of friends? Emerson, I reminded him, says a friend may well be reckoned the masterpiece of nature, sir. Well, you can tell Emerson from me next time you see him that he's an ass. Very good, sir. What I want, um, uh, Jeeves, have you seen that play called, um, I forget its dashed name, no, sir. It's on at the, um, what you call it, I went last night. Uh, the hero's a chap who's buzzing along, you know, quite merry and bright, and suddenly a kid turns up and says she's his daughter, uh, left over from Act One, you know, absolutely the first he'd heard of it. Well, of course, uh, there's a bit of a fuss, and they say to him, what ho? And he says, well, what about it? And they say, well, what about it? And he says, oh, all right, then, if that's the way you feel. And he takes the kid and goes off with her out into the world together, you know. Well, what I'm driving at, Jeeves, is that I envied that chappy. Most awfully jolly little girl, you know, clinging to him trustingly and what not. Something to look after, if you know what I mean. Jeeves, I wish I had a daughter. I wonder what the procedure is. Marriage is, I believe, considered the preliminary step, sir. No, no, no I mean about... Adopting a kid. You can adopt kids, you know, Jeeves. 
but what I want to know is how you start about it. The process, I should imagine, would be highly complicated and laborious, sir. It would cut into your spare time. Well, I'll tell you what I could do, then. My sister will be back from India next week with her three little girls. I'll give up this flat and take a house and have them all to live with me. By Jove, Jeeves, I think that's rather a scheme, what? Prattle of childish voices, eh? Little feet pattering hither and thither, yes? I concealed my perturbation, but the effort to preserve my sang-froid tested my powers to the utmost. The course of action outlined by Mr. Wooster meant the finish of our cosy bachelor establishment if it came into being as a practical proposition, and no doubt some men in my place would at this juncture have voiced their disapproval. I avoided this blunder. If you will pardon my saying so, sir, I suggested, I think you are not quite yourself after your influenza. If I might express the opinion, what you require is a few days by the sea. Brighton is very handy, sir. Are you suggesting that I'm talking through my hat? By no means, sir. I merely advocate a short stay at Brighton as a physical recuperative. Mr. Wooster considered. Well, I'm not sure you're not right, he said at length. I am feeling more or less an onion. You might shove a few things in a suitcase and drive me down in the car tomorrow. Very good, sir. And when we get back, I'll be in the pink and ready to tackle this pattering feet wheeze. Exactly, sir. Well, it was a respite, and I welcomed it. But I began to see that a crisis had arisen which would require adroit handling. Rarely had I observed Mr. Wooster more set on a thing. Indeed, I could recall no such exhibition of determination on his part uh, since the time when he had insisted, against my frank disapproval, on wearing purple socks. However, I had coped successfully with that outbreak, and I was by no means unsanguine that I should eventually be able to bring the present affair to a happy issue. Employers are like horses. They require managing. Some gentlemen's personal gentlemen have the knack of managing them. Some have not. I, I'm happy to say, have no cause for complaint. For myself, I found our stay at Brighton highly enjoyable, and should have been willing to extend it, but Mr. Wooster, still restless, wearied of the place by the end of two days, and on the third afternoon he instructed me to pack up and bring the car round to the hotel. We started back along the London road at about five on a fine summer's day, and had travelled perhaps two miles, when I perceived in the road before us a young lady gesticulating with no little animation. I applied the brake and brought the vehicle to a standstill. Yeah, well, 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 what? inquired Mr. Wooster, waking from a reverie. What is the, the big thought at the back of this, Jeeves? I observed a young lady endeavouring to attract our attention with signals a little way down the road, sir, I explained. She is now making her way towards us. Mr. Wooster peered. Ah, yeah, I, I see her. I expect she wants a lift, Jeeves. That was the interpretation which I placed upon her actions, sir. A jolly-looking kid, said Mr. Wooster. I wonder what she's doing, biffing about the high road. She has the air to me, sir, of one who has been absenting herself without leave from her school, sir. Hello, 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 said Mr. Wooster, as the child reached us. Uh, do you want a lift? Oh, I say, can you? said the child, with marked pleasure. Uh, where do you want to go? There's a turning to the left about a mile further on. If you put me down there, I'll walk the rest of the way. I say, thanks awfully. I've got a nail in my shoe. She climbed in at the back. A red-haired young person with a snub nose and an extremely large grin. Her age, I should imagine, would be about twelve. She let down one of the spare seats and knelt on it to facilitate conversation. I'm going to get into a frightful row, she began. Miss Tomlinson will be perfectly furious. No, really, said Mr. Wooster. 
It's a half holiday, you know, and I sneaked away to Brighton because I wanted to go on the pier and put pennies in the slot machines. I thought I could get back in time so that nobody would notice I'd gone. But I got this nail in my shoe, and now there'll be a fearful row. Oh, well, she said, with a philosophy which I confess I admired. It can't be helped. What's your car? A sunbeam, isn't it? We've got a Woolsey at home. Mr. Wooster was visibly perturbed. As I have indicated, he was, at this time, in a highly malleable frame of mind, tender-hearted to a degree where the young of the female sex was concerned. Her sad case touched him deeply. Oh, I say, this is rather rotten, he observed. Isn't there anything to be done? I say, Jeeves, don't you think something could be done? It was not my place to make the suggestion, sir, I replied. But as you yourself have brought the matter up, I fancy the trouble is susceptible of adjustment. I think it would be a legitimate subterfuge were you to inform the young lady's schoolmistress that you are an old friend of the young lady's father. In this case, you could inform Miss Tomlinson that you had been passing the school and had seen the young lady at the gate and taken her for a drive. Miss Tomlinson's chagrin would no doubt in these circumstances be sensibly diminished, if not altogether dispersed. Well, you are a sportsman, observed the young person with considerable enthusiasm. And she proceeded to kiss me, in connection with which I have only to say that I was sorry she had just been devouring some sticky species of sweetmeat. Jeeves, you've hit it, said Mr. Wooster. A sound, even fruity scheme. I say, I suppose I'd better know your name and all that, if I'm a friend of your father's. My name's Peggy Mannering, thanks awfully, said the young person. And my father's Professor Mannering. He's written a lot of books. You'll be expected to know that. Author of the well-known series of philosophical treaties, uh, I ventured to interject. They have a great vogue, though, if the young lady will pardon my saying so, many of the professor's opinions strike me personally as somewhat empirical. Shall I drive on to the school, sir? Oh, yes, uh, yeah, carry on. I say, Jeeves, it's a rummy thing. You know, I've never been inside a girls' school in my life. Indeed, sir? Ought to be a dashed interesting experience, Jeeves, what? I fancy that you may find it so, sir, I said. We drove on a matter of half a mile down a lane, and, directed by the young person, I turned in at the gates of a house of imposing dimensions, bringing the car to a halt at the front door. Mr. Wooster and Child entered, and presently a parlour-maid came out. You ought to take the car round to the stables, please, she said. Ah, I said. Then everything is satisfactory, eh? Where has Mr. Wooster gone? Miss Peggy has taken him off to meet her friends. And Cook says she hopes she'll step round to the kitchen later and have a cup of tea. Inform her that I shall be delighted. Before I take the car to the stables, would it be possible for me to have a word with Miss Tomlinson? A moment later... I was following her into the drawing-room. Handsome, but strong-minded, that was how I summed up Miss Tomlinson at first glance. In some ways she recalled to mind Mr. Wooster's Aunt Agatha. She had the same penetrating gaze, and that indefinable air of being reluctant to stand any nonsense. "'I fear I am possibly taking a liberty, madam,' I began, but I am hoping that you will allow me to say a word with respect to my employer. I fancy I am correct in supposing that Mr. Wooster did not tell you a great deal about himself. He told me nothing about himself, except that he was a friend of Professor Mannering. He did not inform you, then, that he was THE Mr. Wooster? THE Mr. Wooster? Bertram Wooster, madam. I will say for Mr. Wooster that, mentally negligible though he no doubt is, he has a name that suggests almost infinite possibilities. He sounds, if I may elucidate my meaning, like someone, especially if you've just been informed that he is an intimate friend of so eminent a man as Professor Mannering. 
You might not, no doubt, be able to say offhand whether he was Bertram Wooster the novelist or Bertram Wooster the founder of a new school of thought, but you would have an uneasy feeling that you were exposing your ignorance if you did not give the impression of familiarity with the name. Miss Tomlinson, as I had rather foreseen, nodded brightly. Oh, Bertram Wooster, she said. He is an extremely retiring gentleman, madam, and would be the last to suggest it himself, but knowing him as I do, I am sure that he would take it as a graceful compliment if you were to ask him to address the young ladies. He is an excellent extempore speaker. A very good idea, said Miss Tomlinson decidedly. I am very much obliged to you for suggesting it. I will certainly ask him to talk to the girls. And should he make a pretense, through modesty, of not wishing, I shall insist. Thank you, madam. I am obliged. You will not mention my share in the matter. Mr. Wooster might think I had exceeded my duties. I drove round to the stables and halted the car in the yard. As I got out, I looked at it somewhat intently. It was a good car, and appeared to be in excellent condition, but somehow I seemed to feel that something was going to go wrong with it, something serious, something that would not be able to be put right again for at least a couple of hours. One gets these presentiments. It may have been some half hour later that Mr. Wooster came into the stable yard as I was leaning against the car, enjoying a quiet cigarette. Uh, no, uh, uh, don't chuck it away, Jeeves, he said as I withdrew the cigarette from my mouth. As a matter of fact, I've come to touch you for a smoke. Uh, got one to spare? Only gaspers, I fear, sir. Uh, they'll do, responded Mr. Wooster with no little eagerness. I observed that his manner was a trifle fatigued, and his eyes somewhat wild. It's a rummy thing, Jeeves. I seem to have lost my cigarette case. I can't find it anywhere. I'm sorry to hear that, sir. It is not in the car. No? I must have dropped it somewhere, then. He drew at his gasper with relish. Jolly creatures, small girls, Jeeves, he remarked after a pause. Extremely so, sir. Of course, I can imagine some fellows finding them a, a, a bit exhausting in, uh... En masse, sir? Yeah, that's the word. A bit exhausting en masse. I must confess, sir, that that is how they used to strike me. In my younger day, at the outset of my career, sir, I was at one time page boy in a school for young ladies. No, really? I never knew that before. Uh, I, I say, uh, Jeeves, um... um did the, uh, uh, dear little souls giggle much in your day? Practically without cessation, sir. Uh, it makes a fellow feel a bit of an ass, what? <laughs> I shouldn't wonder if they used to stare at you from time to time, too, eh? At the school where I was employed, sir, the young ladies had a regular game which they were accustomed to play when a male visitor arrived. They would stare fixedly at him and giggle and there was a small prize for the one who made him blush first. Oh, no, I say, Jeeves, not really. Yes, sir. They derived real enjoyment from the pastime. I had no idea small girls were such demons. More deadly than the males, sir. Mr. Wooster passed a handkerchief over his brow. Well, uh, we're going to have tea in a few minutes, Jeeves. I expect I shall feel better after tea. We will hope so, sir. But I was by no means sanguine. I had an agreeable tea in the kitchen. The buttered toast was good, and the maids nice girls, though with little conversation. The parlour-maid, who joined us towards the end of the meal, after performing her duties in the school dining-room, reported that Mr. Wooster was sticking it pluckily, but seemed feverish. I went back to the stable-yard, and I was just giving the car another look-over, when the young Mannering child appeared. Oh, I say, she said, will you give this to Mr. Wooster when you see him? She held out Mr. Wooster's cigarette case. He must have dropped it somewhere. I say, she proceeded, it's an awful lark. He's going to give a lecture to the school. Indeed, miss. We love it when there are lectures. We sit and stare at the poor dears and try to make them dry up. There was a man last term who got hiccups. Do you think Mr. Wooster will get hiccups? 
We can but hope for the best, miss. It would be such a lark, wouldn't it? Highly enjoyable, miss. Well, I must be getting back. I want to get a front seat. And she scampered off. An engaging child, full of spirits. She had hardly gone when there was an agitated noise, and round the corner came Mr. Wooster, perturbed, deeply so. Jeeves! Sir? Start the car! Sir? I'm off! Sir? Mr. Wooster danced a few steps. Don't stand there saying, sir! I tell you, I'm off! Barely off! There's not a moment to waste! The situation's desperate! Dash it, Jeeves, do you know what's happened? The Tomlinson female has just sprung it on me that I'm expected to make a speech to the girls. Got to stand out there in front of the whole dash collection and talk! I can just see myself. Get that car going, Jeeves, dash it all! A little speed! A little speed! Impossible, I fear, sir. The car is out of order. Mr. Wooster gaped at me. Very glassily, he gaped. Out of order? Yes, sir. Something is wrong. Trivial, perhaps, but possibly a matter of some little time to repair. Mr. Wooster, being one of those easy-going young gentlemen who will drive a car but never take the trouble to study its mechanism, I felt justified in becoming technical. I think it is the differential gear, sir. Either that or the exhaust. I am fond of Mr. Wooster, and I admit I came very near to melting as I looked at his face. He was staring at me in a sort of dumb despair that would have touched anybody. Then I'm sunk. Or... A slight gleam of hope flickered across his drawn features. Do you think I could sneak out and leg it across country, Jeeves? Too late, I fear, sir. I indicated with a slight gesture the approaching figure of Miss Tomlinson, who was advancing with a serene determination in his immediate rear. Ah, there you are, Mr. Wooster. He smiled a sickly smile. Uh, yeah, yeah, sir. Uh, here I am. We are all waiting for you in the large schoolroom. Oh, but, 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 but I say, uh, look here, I, uh, I, I don't know a bit what to talk about. Why, anything, Mr. Wooster, anything that comes into your head. Be bright, bright and amusing. Oh, uh, bright and amusing, possibly tell them a few entertaining stories. But at the same time, do not neglect the graver note. Remember that my girls are on the threshold of life, and will be eager to hear something brave and helpful and stimulating, something which they can remember in after years. But of course, you know the sort of thing, Mr. Wooster. Come, the young people are waiting. I have spoken earlier of a resource, and the part it plays in the life of a gentleman's personal gentleman. It is a quality peculiarly necessary if one is to share in scenes not primarily designed for one's cooperation. So much that is interesting in life goes on apart behind closed doors that your gentleman's gentleman, if he is not to remain hopelessly behind the march of events, should exercise his wits in order to enable himself to be if not a spectator, at least an auditor, when there is anything of interest toward. I deprecate, as vulgar and undignified, the practice of listening at keyholes, but without luring myself to that, I have generally contrived to find a way. In the present case, it was simple. The large schoolroom was situated on the ground floor, with commodious French windows, which, as the weather was clement, remained open throughout the proceedings. By stationing myself behind a pillar on the porch or veranda which adjoined the room, I was enabled to see and hear all. It was an experience which I should be sorry to have missed. Uh, Mr. Wooster, I may say at once, indubitably excelled himself. Mr. Wooster is a young gentleman with practically every desirable quality except one. I do not mean brains, for in an employer brains are not desirable. The quality to which I allude is hard to define, but perhaps I might call it the gift of dealing with the unusual situation. 
In the presence of the unusual, Mr. Wooster is too prone to smile weakly and allow his eyes to protrude. He lacks presence. I have often wished that I had the power to bestow upon him some of the savoir faire of a former employer of mine, Mr. Montague Todd, the well-known financier, now in the second year of his sentence. I have known men call upon Mr. Todd with the express intention of horsewhipping him and go away half an hour later laughing heartily and smoking one of his cigars. To Mr. Todd it would have been child's play to speak a few impromptu words to a schoolroom full of young ladies. In fact, before he had finished, he would probably have induced them to invest all their pocket money in one of his numerous companies. But to Mr. Wooster it was plainly an ordeal of the worst description. He gave one look at the young ladies, who were all staring at him in an extremely unwinking manner, then blinked and started to pick feebly at his coat sleeve. His aspect reminded me of that of a bashful young man who, persuaded against his better judgment to go on the platform and assist a conjurer in his entertainment, suddenly discovers that rabbits and hard-boiled eggs are being taken out of the top of his head. The proceedings opened with a short but graceful speech of introduction from Miss Tomlinson. Girls, said Miss Tomlinson, some of you have already met Mr. Wooster, Mr. Bertram Wooster, and you all, I hope, know him by reputation. Here, I regret to say, Mr. Wooster gave a hideous, gurgling laugh, and, catching Miss Tomlinson's eye, turned a bright scarlet. Miss Tomlinson resumed... He has very kindly consented to say a few words to you before he leaves, and I am sure that you will all give him your very earnest attention. Now, please. She gave a spacious gesture with her right hand as she said the last two words, and Mr. Wooster, apparently under the impression that they were addressed to him, cleared his throat and began to speak. But it appeared that her remark was directed to the young ladies, and was in the nature of a cue or signal, for she had no sooner spoken to them than the whole school rose to its feet in a body and burst into a species of chant, of which I am glad to say I remember the words, though the tune eludes me. The words ran as follows. Many greetings to you, many greetings to you, many greetings, dear stranger, Many greetings, many greetings, many greetings to you, many greetings to you, to you. Considerable latitude of choice was given to the singers in the matter of key, and there was little of what I might call cooperative effort. Each child went on till she had reached the end, then stopped and waited for the stragglers to come up. It was an unusual performance, and I personally found it extremely exhilarating. It seemed to smite Mr. Wooster, however, like a blow. He recoiled a couple of steps and flung up an arm defensively. Then the uproar died away, and an air of expectancy fell upon the room. Miss Tomlinson directed a brightly authoritative gaze upon Mr. Wooster, and he blinked, gulped once or twice, and tottered forward. Well, uh, uh, you know... He said. Then it seemed to strike him that this opening lacked the proper formal dignity. Um, ladies! A silvery peal of laughter from the front row stopped him again. Girls! said Miss Tomlinson. She spoke in a low, soft voice, but the effect was immediate. Perfect stillness instantly descended upon all present. I am bound to say that, brief as my acquaintance with Miss Tomlinson had been, I could recall few women I had admired more. She had grip. I fancy that Miss Tomlinson had gauged Mr. Wooster's oratorical capabilities pretty correctly by this time, and had come to the conclusion that little in the way of a stirring address was to be expected from him. Perhaps, she said, as it is getting late, and he has not very much time to spare, Mr. Wooster will just give you some little word of advice which may be helpful to you in after life. And then we will sing the school song and disperse to our evening lessons. She looked at Mr. Wooster. 
he passed a finger round the inside of his collar. Yeah, he, ad ad advice? Afterlife? <laughs> what, what? Well, I, I, I don't know. Just some brief word of counsel, Mr. Wooster, said Miss Tomlinson firmly. Oh, well, um, well, yes, uh, uh well, uh, it was painful to see Mr. Wooster's brain endeavouring to work. Well, I'll tell you something that's often done me a bit of good, and it's a thing not many people know. My old Uncle Henry gave me the tip when I first came to London. Never forget, my boy, he said, that if you stand outside Romano's in the Strand, you can see the clock on the wall of the law courts down in Fleet Street. Most people who don't know don't believe it's possible, because there are a couple of churches in the middle of the road, and you'd think they'd be in the way. But you can, and it's worth knowing. You can win a lot of money betting on it with fellows who haven't found it out. <laughs> and by Jove, he was perfectly right. And it, it's a thing to remember. Many a quid have I... Miss Tomlinson gave a hard, dry cough, and he stopped in the middle of a sentence. Perhaps it will be better, Mr. Wooster, she said in a cold, even voice, if you were to tell my girl some little story. What you say is no doubt extremely interesting, but perhaps a little... Oh, uh, 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 yes, said Mr. Wooster. A story? A story? He appeared completely distraught, poor young gentleman. Um, I wonder if you've heard the one about the, the stockbroker and the chorus girl. We will now sing the school song, said Miss Tomlinson, rising like an iceberg. I decided not to remain for the singing of the school song. It seemed probable to me that Mr. Wooster would shortly be requiring the car... So I made my way back to the stable yard to be in readiness. I had not long to wait. In a very few moments he appeared, tottering. Mr. Wooster's is not one of those inscrutable faces which it is impossible to read. On the contrary, it is a limpid pool in which is mirrored each passing emotion. I could read it now like a book, and his first words were very much on the lines I had anticipated. Jeeves, he said hoarsely. Jeeves, is that damned car mended yet? Just this moment, sir. I have been working on it assiduously. Then, for heaven's sake, let's go. But I understood that you were to address the young ladies, sir. Oh, I've done that, I've done that, responded Mr. Wooster, blinking twice with extraordinary rapidity. Yes, I've done that. It was a success, I hope, sir. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Most extraordinarily successful. Went like a breeze. But, um, and I, I think I, I may as well be going. Um, no use out staying one's welcome, what? Assuredly not, sir. I had climbed into my seat and was about to start the engine when voices made themselves heard. And at the first sound of them, Mr. Wooster sprang, with almost incredible nimbleness, into the tonneau. And when I glanced round, he was on the floor, covering himself with a rug. The last I saw of him was a pleading eye. "'Have you seen Mr. Wooster, my man?' Miss Tomlinson had entered the stable yard, accompanied by a lady of, I should say, judging from her accent, French origin. "'No, madam.' The French lady uttered some exclamation in her native tongue. "'Is anything wrong, madam?' I inquired. Miss Tomlinson, in normal mood, was, I should be disposed to imagine, a lady who would not readily confide her troubles to the ear of a gentleman's gentleman, however sympathetic his aspect. That she did so now was sufficient indication of the depth to which she was stirred. "'Yes, there is. Mademoiselle has just found several of the girls smoking cigarettes in the shrubbery. When questioned, they stated that Mr. Wooster had given them the horrid things. She turned. He must be in the garden somewhere, or in the house. I think the man is out of his senses. Come, mademoiselle. It must have been about a minute later that Mr. Wooster poked his head out of the rug like a tortoise. Jeeves! Sir? Get a move on! Start her up! Get going and keep going! I applied my foot to the self-starter. It would perhaps be safest to drive carefully until we are out of the school ground, sir, I said. I might run over one of the young ladies, sir. 
Well, what's the objection to that? demanded Mr. Wooster with extraordinary bitterness. Or even Miss Tomlinson, sir. Don't, said Mr. Wooster wistfully. Don't. You make my mouth water. Jeeves, said Mr. Wooster, when I brought him his whisky and siphon one night about a week later. This is dashed jolly. Sir? Jolly. Cosy and pleasant, you know. I mean, looking at the clock and wondering if you're going to be late with the good old drinks. And then you coming in with the tray always on time, never a minute late, and shoving it down on the table and biffing off. And the next night coming in and shoving it down and biffing off. And the next night, I mean, give you a sort of safe, restful feeling. Soothing. That's the word. Soothing. Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, sir. Well? Have you succeeded in finding a suitable house yet, sir? A house? Uh, what do you mean, house? I understood, sir, that it was your intention to give up the flat and take a house of sufficient size to enable you to have your sister, Mrs. Schofield, and her three young ladies to live with you. Mr. Wooster shuddered strongly. Oh, <laughs> That's off, Jeeves, he said. Very good, sir, I replied. Our second story bears a somewhat colloquial title. Imagine, if you will... I say, Jeeves. Sir? Now, look here. It's all very well you blathering on with tales of the young master's daring do, or otherwise... Sir? But I'm jolly well going to spill the beans myself on this one. Very good, sir. And I, I've always been a dab hand at the old yarn, don't you know? Long evenings at the drones club and all that, drawing away round the fireside. Indeed, sir. So clear the decks and let the dog see the, uh, um... Rabbit, sir? Oh, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, that's the fellow. Right here, then. Here we go. Well, <laughs> it all began... Yeah... Uh, uh, Jeeves, sir, uh, what's his bally story called? Uh, you know, the one about old Freddy Bullivant and the trip to Marvis Bay. Fixing it for Freddy, I believe, sir. Oh, yes. Capital. Right. Yeah. Well, go ahead and announce it then, Jeeves. Yes, sir. Fixing it for Freddy. Jeeves, I said. Looking in on him one afternoon, on my return from the club. I don't want to interrupt you. No, sir. But I, I would like a word with you. Yes, sir. He'd been packing a few of the Worcester necessaries in the old kit bag against our approaching visit to the seaside. And he now rose and stood bursting with courteous zeal. Uh, Jeeves, I said, a, a somewhat disturbing situation has arisen with regard to a pal of mine. Indeed, sir. Uh, you know Mr. Bullivant? Yes, sir. Well, I slid into the drones this morning for a bite of lunch and found him in a dark corner of the smoking room looking like the last rose of summer. Well, naturally, I was surprised. You know what a bright lad he is as a rule, the life and soul of every gathering he attends. Yes, sir. Uh, quite the little lump of fun, in fact. Precisely, sir. Well, I made inquiries and he told me that he'd had a quarrel with the girl he's engaged to. Uh, you knew he was engaged to Miss Elizabeth Vickers? Yes, sir. I recall reading the announcement in the Morning Post. Well, he isn't any longer. What the row was about, he didn't say. But the broad facts, Jeeves, are that she has scratched the fixture. She won't let him come near her, refuses to talk on the phone, and sends back his letters unopened. Extremely trying, sir. We ought to do something, Jeeves. But what? It is somewhat difficult to make a suggestion, sir. Well, what I'm going to do for a start is to take him down to Marvis Bay with me. I know these birds have been handed their hat by the girl of their dreams, Jeeves. What they want is a complete change of scene. There is much in what you say, sir. Yes, change of scene is the thing. <laughs> yeah. I heard of a man. Girl refused him. Man went abroad. Two months later, girl wired him, Come back, Muriel. 
man started to write out a reply, suddenly found that he couldn't remember the girl's surname, so never answered at all, and lived happily ever after. It may well be, Jeeves, that after Freddy Bullivant has had a few weeks of Marvis Bay, he will get completely over it. Very possibly, sir. And if not, it's quite likely that, refreshed by sea air and good simple food, you will get a brainwave and think up some scheme for bringing these two misguided blighters together again. I will do my best, sir. I knew it, Jeeves. I knew it. Oh, uh, don't forget to put in plenty of socks. No, sir. Also of tennis shirts, not a few. Very good, sir. I left him to his packing and a couple of days later we started off for Marvis Bay, where I'd taken a cottage for July and August. I don't know if you know Marvis Bay. It's in Dorsetshire, and while not what you'd call a fiercely exciting spot, has many good points. You spend the day there, bathing and sitting on the sands, and in the evening you stroll out on the shore with the mosquitoes. At nine you rub ointment on the wounds and go to bed. It's a simple, healthy life, and it seemed to suit poor old Freddy absolutely. Once the moon was up and the breeze sighing in the trees, you couldn't drag him from that beach with ropes. He became quite a popular pet with the mosquitoes. They'd hang around waiting for him to come out and would give a miss to perfectly good strollers just so as to be in good condition for him. It was during the day that I found Freddy, poor old chap, a trifle heavy as a guest. I suppose you can't blame a bloke whose heart is broken, but it required a good deal of fortitude to bear up against this gloom-crushed exhibit during the early days of our little holiday. When he wasn't chewing a pipe and scowling at the carpet, he was sitting at the piano playing the rosary with one finger. He couldn't play anything except the rosary, and he couldn't play much of that. However firmly and confidently he started off, somewhere around the third bar a fuse would blow out and he'd have to start all over again. He was playing it, as usual, one morning, when I came in from bathing, and it seemed to me that he was extracting more hideous melancholy from it even than usual. Nor had my sense deceived me. Bertie he said in a hollow voice, skidding on the fourth crotchet from the left as he went to the second bar, and producing a distressing sound like the death rattle of a sand eel. I've seen her. Seen her? I said. What, Elizabeth Vickers? Well, how do you mean you've seen her? She isn't down here. Yes, she is. I suppose she's staying with relations or something. I was down at the post office, seeing if there were any letters, and we met in the doorway. Well, what happened? She cut me dead. He started the rosary again and stubbed his finger on a semi-quaver. Bertie, he said, you ought never to have brought me here. I must go away. Go away? Don't talk such rot. This is the best thing that could have happened. It's the most amazing bit of luck, her being down here. This is where you come out strong. She cut me. Never mind. Be a sportsman. Have another dash at her. She looked clean through me. Well, don't mind that. Stick at it. Now, having got her down here, what you want, I said, is to place her under some obligation to you. What you want is to get her timidly thanking you. Now, what you want, what's she going to thank me timidly for? I thought for a while. Undoubtedly, he'd put his finger on the nub of the problem. Uh, for some moments I was at a loss, not to say nonplussed. Then I saw the way. What you want, I said, is to look out for a chance and save her from drowning. I can't swim. That was Freddy Bullivant all over. A dear old chap in a thousand ways, but no help to a fellow, if you know what I mean. He cranked up the piano once more, and I legged it for the open. I strolled out on the beach and began to think this thing over. I would have liked to consult Jeeves, of course, but Jeeves had disappeared for the morning. There was no doubt that it was hopeless expecting Freddy to do anything for himself in this crisis. I'm not saying that dear old Freddy hasn't got his strong qualities. He's good at polo, and I've heard him spoken of as a coming man at snooker pool. But apart from this, you couldn't call him a man of enterprise. Well, I was rounding some rocks, thinking pretty tensely, 
when I caught sight of a blue dress, and there was the girl in person. I'd never met her, but Freddy had sixteen photographs of her sprinkled round his bedroom, and I knew I couldn't be mistaken. She was sitting on the sand, helping a small fat child to build a castle. On a chair close by was an elderly female reading a novel. I heard the girl call her aunt, so getting the reasoning faculties to work, I deduced that the fat child must be her cousin. Now, it struck me that if Freddy had been there, he would probably have tried to work up some sentiment about the kid on the strength of it. I couldn't manage this. I don't think I ever saw a kid who made me feel less sentimental. He was one of those round, bulging kids. After he'd finished his castle, he seemed to get bored with life and began to cry. The girl, who seemed to read him like a book, took him off to where a fellow was selling sweets at a stall. And I walked on. Now, those who know me, if you ask them, will tell you that I'm a chump. That my Aunt Agatha would testify to this effect. And so would my Uncle Percy, and many more of my nearest and, um, if you like to use the expression, dearest. Well, I don't mind. I admit it. I am a chump. But what I do say, and I should like to lay the greatest possible stress on this, is that every now and then, just when the populace has given up hope that I will ever show any real human intelligence, I get what it is idle to pretend is not an inspiration. And that's what happened now. I doubt if the idea that came to me at this juncture would have occurred to a single one of any dozen of the largest-brained blokes in history. Or Napoleon might have got it, but I'll bet Darwin and Shakespeare and Thomas Hardy wouldn't have thought of it in a thousand years. It came to me on my return journey. I was walking back along the shore, exercising the old bean fiercely, when I saw the fat child meditatively smacking a jellyfish with a spade. The girl wasn't with him. The aunt wasn't with him. In fact, there wasn't anybody else in sight. And the solution of the whole trouble between Freddy and his Elizabeth suddenly came to me in a flash. From what I'd seen of the two, the girl was evidently fond of this kid. And anyhow, he was her cousin. So what I said to myself was this. If I kidnap this young heavyweight for a brief space of time, and if, when the girl has got frightfully anxious about where he can have got to, dear old Freddy suddenly appears, leading the infant by the hand, and telling a story to the effect that he found him wandering at large about the country, and practically saved his life, <laughs> the girl's gratitude is bound to make her chuck hostilities and be friends again. So, I gather up the kid and made off with him. Freddy, dear old chap, was rather slow at first in getting on to the fine points of the idea. When I appeared at the cottage, carrying the child, and dumped him down in the sitting-room, he showed no joy whatever. The child had started to bellow by this time, not thinking much of the thing, and Freddy seemed to find it rather trying. "'What the devil's all this?' he asked, regarding the little visitor with a, a good deal of loathing. The kid loosed off a yell that made the windows rattle, and I saw that this was a time for strategy. I raced to the kitchen and fetched a pot of honey. It was the right idea. The kid stopped bellowing and began to smear his face with the stuff. Well, said Freddy, when silence had set in, I explained the scheme. After a while, it began to strike him. The careworn look faded from his face, and for the first time since his arrival at Marvis Bay, he smiled almost happily. There's something in this, Bertie. It's the gods. I think it'll work, said Freddy. And disentangling the child from the honey, he led him out. I expect Elizabeth will be on the beach somewhere, he said. What you might call a quiet happiness suffused me, if that's the word I want. I was very fond of old Freddy, and it was jolly to think that he was shortly about to click once more. I was leaning back in a chair on the veranda, smoking a peaceful cigarette, when down the road I saw the old boy returning, and, by George, the kid was still with him. Hello, I said. Couldn't you find her? 
I then perceived that Freddy was looking as if he'd been kicked in the stomach. Yes, I found her, he replied, with one of those bitter, mirthless laughs you read about. Well, then, he sank into a chair and groaned. This isn't a cousin, you idiot, he said. It's no relation at all, just a kid she met on the beach. She'd never seen him before in her life. But she was helping him build a sandcastle. I don't care. He's a perfect stranger. It seemed to me that if the modern girl goes about building sandcastles with kids she's only known for five minutes, and probably without a proper introduction at that, then all that has been written about her is perfectly true. Brazen is the word that seems to meet the case. I said as much to Freddy, but he wasn't listening. Well, who is this ghastly child, then? I said. I don't know. Oh, Lord, I've had a time. Thank goodness you'll probably spend the next few years of your life in Dartmoor for kidnapping. That's my only consolation. I'll come and jeer at you through the bars on visiting days. Tell me all, old man, I said. He told me all. It took him a good long time to do it, for he broke off in the middle of nearly every sentence to call me names. But I gradually gathered what had happened. The girl Elizabeth had listened like an iceberg while he worked off the story he'd prepared. And then, well, she didn't actually call him a liar in so many words, but she gave him to understand in a general sort of way that he was a worm and an outcast. And then he crawled off with the kid, licked to a splinter. And mind he concluded. This is your affair. I'm not mixed up in it at all. If you want to escape your sentence, or anyway get a portion of it remitted, you'd better go and find the child's parents and return him before the police come for you. Well, who are his parents? I don't know. Where do they live? I don't know. The kid didn't seem to know either. A thoroughly vapid and uninformed infant. I got out of him the fact that he had a father, but that was as far as he went. It didn't seem ever to have occurred to him, chatting of an evening with the old man, to ask him his name and address. So, after a wasted ten minutes, out we went into the great world, more or less what you might call at random. I give you my word that until I started to tramp the place with this child, I never had a notion that it was such a difficult job restoring a son to his parents. How kidnappers ever get caught is a mystery to me. I searched Marvis Bay like a bloodhound, but nobody came forward to claim the infant. You'd have thought, from the lack of interest in him, that he was stopping there all by himself, in a cottage of his own. It wasn't till, by another inspiration, I thought to ask the sweet store man that I got on the track. The sweet store man, who seemed to have seen a lot of him, uh, said that the child's name was Kegworthy, and that his parents lived at a place called Ocean Rest. It then remained to find Ocean Rest. And eventually, after visiting Ocean View, Ocean Prospect, Ocean Breeze, Ocean Cottage, Ocean Bungalow, Ocean Nook, and Ocean Homestead, I trailed it down. I knocked at the door. Nobody answered. I knocked again. I could hear movements inside, but nobody appeared. I was just going to get to work with that knocker in such a way that it would filter through these people's heads that I wasn't standing there just for the fun of the thing, when a voice from somewhere above shouted, Hi! I looked up and saw a round pink face with grey whiskers east and west of it staring down at me from an upper window. Hi! it shouted again. You can't come in. I don't want to come in, because, oh, is that Tootles? My name is not Tootles. Are you Mr. Kegworthy? I brought back your son. I see him. Peepo, Tootles. Dada can see you. The face disappeared with a jerk. I could hear voices. The face reappeared. Hi! I churned the gravel madly. This blighter was giving me the pip. Do you live here? asked the face. I've taken a cottage here for a few weeks. What's your name? Wooster. Oh, fancy that. Do you spell it W-O-R-C-E-S-T-E-R or W-O-O-S-T-E-R? W -O, w o I ask because I once knew a Miss Wooster spelled W-O... I'd had about enough of this spelling bee. 
Will you open the door and take this child in? I mustn't open the door. Uh, this Miss Wooster that I knew married a man named Spencer. Uh, was she any relation? She is my Aunt Agatha, I replied, and I spoke with a good deal of bitterness, trying to suggest by my manner that he was exactly the sort of man, in my opinion, who would know my Aunt Agatha. He beamed down at me. Oh, this is most fortunate. Uh, we were wondering what to do with Tootles. You see, we have mumps here. My daughter Bootles has just developed mumps. Tootles must not be exposed to the risk of infection. We couldn't think what to do with him. It was most fortunate your finding the dear child. He strayed from his nurse. I would hesitate to trust him to a stranger, but you are different. Any nephew of Mrs. Spencer's has my complete confidence. You must take Tootles into your house. It'll be an ideal arrangement. I've written to my brother in London to come and fetch him. He may be here in a few days. May? Well, he's a busy man, of course, but he should certainly be here within a week. Uh, till then, Tootles can stop with you. It's an excellent plan. Very much obliged to you. Your wife will like Tootles. I haven't got a wife, I yelled. But the window had closed with a bang, as if the man with the whiskers had found a germ trying to escape and had headed it off just in time. I breathed a deep breath and wiped the old forehead. The window flew up again. Hi! A package weighing about a ton hit me on the head and burst like a bomb. Did you catch it? said the face, reappearing. Oh, dear me, you missed it. Never mind, you can get it at the grocer's. Ask for Bailey's granulated breakfast chips. Tootles takes them for breakfast with a little milk. Not cream, milk. Be sure to get Bailey's. Well, uh, yes, but the face disappeared and the window was banged down again. I lingered a while. But nothing else happened. So, taking Tootles by the hand, I walked slowly away. And as we turned up the road, we met Freddy's Elizabeth. Well, baby, she said, sighting the kid. So Daddy found you again, did he? Your little son and I made great friends on the beach this morning, she said to me. This was the limit. Coming on top of that interview with the whiskered lunatic, it so utterly unnerved me that she'd nodded goodbye and was halfway down the road before I caught up with my breath enough to deny the charge of being the infant's father. I hadn't expected Freddy to sing with joy when he saw me looming up with Child Complete, but I did think he might have showed a little more manly fortitude, a little more of the old British bulldog spirit. He leapt up when we came in, glared at the kid, and clutched his head. He didn't speak for a long time, but to make up for it, when he began, he did not leave off for a long time. Well, he said, when he'd finished the body of his remarks, say something. Heavens, man, why don't you say something? Well, if you'll give me a chance, I will, I said, and shot the bad news. What are you going to do about it? he asked and it would be idle to deny that his manner was peevish. What can we do about it? We? What do you mean, we? I'm not going to spend my time taking turns as a nursemaid to this excrescence. I'm going back to London. Freddy, I cried. Freddy, oh, ma'am. My voice shook. Would you desert a pal at a time like this? Yes, I would. Freddy, Freddy, I said. You've got to stand by me. You must. Do you realize that this child has to be undressed and bathed and dressed again? You wouldn't leave me to do all that single-handed. Well, Jeeves can help you. Uh, no, sir, said Jeeves, who'd just rolled in with lunch. I must, I fear, disassociate myself completely from the matter. He spoke respectfully, but firmly. I have had little or no experience with children. Well, now's the time to start. I urged. No, sir, I am sorry to say that I cannot involve myself in any way. Well, then you must stand by me, Freddy. I won't. You must. You must. Reflect, old man. We've been pals for years. Your mother likes me. No, she doesn't. Well, anyway, we were at school together, and you owe me a tenner. Oh, well, he said, in a resigned sort of voice. Besides, old thing, I said, I did it all for your sake, you know. He looked at me in a curious way and breathed rather hard for some moments. Bertie, he said, one moment. I will stand a good deal. 
but I will not stand being expected to be grateful. Looking back at it, I can see that what saved me from Coney Hatch in this crisis was my bright idea in buying up most of the contents of the local sweet shop. By serving out sweets to the kid practically incessantly, we managed to get through the rest of that day pretty satisfactorily. At eight o'clock, he fell asleep in a chair, and having undressed him by unbuttoning every button in sight, and where there were no buttons pulling till something gave, we carried him up to bed. Freddy stood looking at the pile of clothes on the floor with a sort of careworn wrinkle between his eyes, and I knew what he was thinking. To get the kid undressed had been simple, a mere matter of muscle. But how were we to get him into his clothes again? I stirred the heap with my foot. There was a long linen arrangement which might have been anything. Also a strip of pink flannel which was like nothing on earth, or most unpleasant. But in the morning I remembered that there were children in the next bungalow but one and I went there before breakfast and borrowed their nurse. Women are wonderful. By Jove, they are. This nurse had all the spare parts assembled and in the right places in about eight minutes, and there was the kid, dressed and looking fit to go to a garden party at Buckingham Palace. I showered wealth upon her, and she promised to come in morning and evening. I sat down to breakfast almost cheerful again, it was the first bit of silver lining that had presented itself to date. And after all, I said, there's lots to be argued in favour of having a child about the place, if you know what I mean. Kind of cosy and domestic, what? Just then the kid upset the milk over Freddy's trousers, and when he'd come back after changing, he lacked sparkle. It was shortly after breakfast that Jeeves asked if he could have a word in my ear. Now, though in the anguish of recent events I had rather tended to forget what had been the original idea in bringing Freddy down to this place, I hadn't forgotten it altogether, and I'm bound to say that as the days went by, I'd found myself a little disappointed in Jeeves. The scheme had been, if you recall, that he should refresh himself with sea air and simple food, and having thus got his brain into prime working order, evolve some means of bringing Freddy and his Elizabeth together again. And what had happened? The man had eaten well, and he'd slept well, but not a step did he appear to have taken towards bringing about the happy ending. The only move that had been made in that direction had been made by me, alone and unaided, and though I freely admit that it had turned out a good deal of a bloomer, still the fact remains that I'd shown zeal and enterprise. Consequently, I received him with a bit of hauteur when he blew in. Slightly cold, a trifle frosty. Yes, Jeeves, I said. You wish to speak to me? Yes, sir. Say on, Jeeves, I said. Thank you, sir. What I desired to say, sir, was this. I attended a performance at the local cinema last night. I raised the eyebrows. I was surprised at the man. With life in the home so frightfully tense, and the young master up against it to such a fearful extent, I disapproved of him coming toddling in and prattling about his amusements. I hope you enjoyed yourself, I said in a rather nasty manner. Yes, sir, thank you. The management was presenting a super, super film in seven reels, dealing with life in the wilder and more feverish strata of New York society, featuring Bertha Blevich, Orlando Murphy, and Baby Bobby. I found it most entertaining, sir. Well, that's good, I said. And if you have a nice time this morning on the sands with your spade and bucket, you will come and tell me about it, won't you? I had so little on my mind just now that it's a treat to hear all about your happy holiday. Satirical, if you see what I mean. Sarcastic. Almost bitter, as a matter of fact, if you come right down to it. The title of the film was Tiny Hands, sir. And the father and mother of the character played by Baby Bobby had unfortunately drifted apart. Too bad, I said. Although at heart they loved each other still, sir. Oh, did they really? Well, I'm glad you told me that. And so matters went on, sir till came a day when Jeeves, 
I said, fixing him with a dashed, unpleasant eye. What the dickens do you think you're talking about? Do you suppose that with this infernal child landed on me, and the peace of the home practically shattered into a million bits, I want to hear... I beg your pardon, sir. I would not have mentioned this cinema performance were it not for the fact that it gave me an idea, sir. An idea? An idea that will, I fancy, sir, prove of value in straightening out the matrimonial future of Mr. Bullivant. To which end, if you recollect, sir, you desired me to... I snorted with remorse. Jeeves, I said, I wronged you. Not at all, sir. Yes, I did. I wronged you. I had a notion that you'd given yourself up entirely to the pleasures of the seaside, and had chucked that business altogether. I might have known better. Tell me all, Jeeves. He bowed in a gratified manner. I beamed. And while we didn't actually fall on each other's necks, we gave each other to understand that all was well once more. In this super, super film, Tiny Hands, sir, said Jeeves, the parents of the child had, as I say, drifted apart. Drifted apart, I said, nodding. Right. And then came a day, sir, when their little child brought them together again. How? If I remember rightly, sir, he said, Dada doesn't do love mummy no more. And then they exhibited a good deal of emotion. There was what I believe is termed a cutback, showing scenes from their courtship and early married life, and some glimpses of lovers through the ages, and the picture concluded with a close-up of the pair in an embrace, with the child looking on with natural gratification, and an organ playing hearts and flowers in the distance. Proceed, Jeeves, I said. You interest me strangely. I begin to grasp the idea. You mean... I mean, sir, that with this young gentleman on the premises, it might be possible to arrange a denouement of a somewhat similar nature in regard to Mr. Bullivant and Miss Vickers. But aren't you overlooking the fact that this kid is no relation of Mr. Bullivant or Miss Vickers? Even with that handicap, sir, I fancy that good results might ensue. I think if it were possible to bring Mr. Bullivant and Miss Vickers together for a short space of time in the presence of the child, sir, and if the child were to say something of a touching nature... I follow you absolutely, Jeeves! I cried with enthusiasm. It's big. This is the way I see it. We lay the scene in this room. Child centre... Girl left centre, Freddy upstage playing the piano. No, 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 that won't do. He can only play a little of the rosary with one finger, so we'll have to cut out the soft music. No, but, but the rest's all right. Look here. This ink pot is Miss Vickers. This mug with a present from Marvis Bay on it is the child. This pen wiper is Mr. Bullivant. Start with dialogue leading up to child's line. Child speaks line, let us say... Boofer lady, does who love dada? Business of outstretched hands. Hold picture for a moment. Freddy crosses left, takes girl's hand. Business of swallowing lump in throat. Then big speech. Ah, oh, Elizabeth, has not this misunderstanding of ours gone on too long? See, a little child rebukes us, and, 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 and so on. No, I, I'm just giving you the general outline. Freddy must work up his own part, and we must get a good line for the child. Boofer lady does who love Dada isn't definite enough. We want something more... If I might make the suggestion, sir. Uh, yes? I would advocate the words, kiss Freddy. It is short readily memorized, and has what I believe is technically termed the punch. Genius, Jeeves! Well, thank you very much, sir. Kiss Freddy it is, then. Oh, uh, but I say, Jeeves, uh, how the deuce are we to get them together in here? Miss Vickers cuts Mr. Bullivant. She wouldn't come within a mile of him. It is awkward, sir. Uh, it doesn't matter. We shall have to make it an exterior set instead of an interior. We can easily corner her on the beach somewhere when we're ready. Meanwhile, we must get the kid word perfect. Yes, sir. Right. First rehearsal for lines and business at eleven sharp tomorrow morning. Poor old Freddy was in such a gloomy frame of mind that I decided not to tell him the idea till we'd finished coaching the child. 
He wasn't in the mood to have a thing like that hanging over him. So we concentrated on Tootles. And pretty early in the proceedings, we saw that the only way to get Tootles worked up to the spirit of the thing was to introduce sweets of some sort, as a sub-motive, so to speak. The chief difficulty, sir, said Jeeves at the end of the first rehearsal, is, as I envisage it, to establish in the young gentleman's mind a connection between the words we desire him to say and the refreshment. Exactly, I said. Once the blighter has grasped the basic fact that these two words, clearly spoken, result automatically in chocolate nougat, we've got a success. I've often thought how interesting it must be to be one of those animal trainer blokes, uh, to, to stimulate the dawning intelligence and all that. Well, this was every bit as exciting. Some days success seemed to be staring us in the eyeball, and the kid got out the line as if he'd been an old professional. And then he'd go all to pieces again. And time was flying. We must hurry up, Jeeves, I said. The kid's uncle may arrive any day now and take him away. Exactly, sir. And we have no understudy. Very true, sir. We must work. I must say, this child is a bit discouraging at times. I should have thought a deaf mute would have learned his part by now. I will say this for the kid, though. He was a trier. Failure didn't damp him. Whenever there was any kind of sweet in sight, he had a dash at his line, and kept saying something till he'd got what he was after. His chief fault was his uncertainty. Personally, I would have been prepared to risk opening in the act, and was ready to start the public performance at the first opportunity, but Jeeves said no. I would not advocate undue haste, sir. As long as the young gentleman's memory refuses to act with any certainty, we are running grave risks of failure. Today, if you recollect, sir, he said, Kick, Freddy. That is not a speech to win a young lady's heart, sir. No, no, and she might do it, too. You're right. We must postpone production. But, by Jove, we didn't. The curtain went up the very next afternoon. It was nobody's fault. Certainly not mine. It was just fate. Jeeves was out, and I was alone in the house with Freddy and the child. Freddy had just settled down at the piano, and I was leading the kid out of the place for a bit of exercise, when, just as we'd got onto the veranda, along came the girl Elizabeth on her way to the beach. And at the sight of her, the kid set up a matey yell, and she stopped at the foot of the steps. Hello, baby, she said. Good morning, she said to me. May I come up? She didn't wait for an answer. She just hopped onto the veranda. She seemed to be that sort of girl. She started fussing over the child, and six feet away, mind you, Freddy smiting the piano in the sitting room. It was a dash disturbing situation, take it from Bertram. At any minute, Freddy might take it into his head to come out on the veranda, and I hadn't even begun to rehearse him in his part. I tried to break up the scene. Um, we were just going down to the beach, I said. Yes, said the girl. She listened for a moment. So, you're having your piano tuned, she said. My aunt has been trying to find a tuner for hours. Uh, do you mind if I go in and tell this man to come on to us when he's finished here? I mopped the brow. And, and I, I shouldn't um, go in just now. <laughs> Not uh, just now, uh, while he's working, if you don't mind. Uh, these fellows can't bear to be disturbed when they're at work. It's the artistic temperament. I I'll tell him later. Oh, very well. Ask him to call it Pine Bungalow. Vickers is the name. Oh, he seems to have stopped. I suppose he'll be out in a minute now. I'll wait. D -d -d Don't you think, um, shouldn't you be getting on to the beach? I said. She'd started talking to the kid and didn't hear. She was feeling in her bag for something. The, 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 the beach, beach, I babbled. See what I've got for you, baby said the girl. I thought I might meet you somewhere, so I bought some of your favourite sweets. And by Jove, she held up in front of the kid's bulging eyes a chunk of toffee about the size of the Albert Memorial. That finished it. We'd just been having a long rehearsal, and the kid was all worked up in his part. He got it right first time. Kiss Freddy, he shouted. 
and the French windows opened, and Freddy came out onto the veranda for all the world as if he'd been taking a cue. Kiss Freddy! shrieked the child. Freddy looked at the girl, and the girl looked at him. I looked at the ground, and the kid looked at the toffee. Kiss Freddy! he yelled. Kiss Freddy! What does this mean? said the girl, turning on me. Uh, you'd better give it him, I said. He'll go on till you do, you know. She gave the kid the toffee, and he subsided. Freddy, poor ass, still stood there gaping without a word. What does it mean? said the girl again. Her face was pink, and her eyes were sparkling in the sort of way, don't you know, that makes a fellow feel as if he hadn't any bones in him, if you know what I mean. Yes, Bertram felt filleted. Did you ever tread on your partner's dress at a dance? I'm speaking now of the days when women wore dresses long enough to be trodden on, and hear it rip, and see her smile at you like an angel, and say, please don't apologize, it's nothing, and then suddenly meet her clear blue eyes, and feel as if you'd stepped on the teeth of a rake, and had the handle jump up and hit you in the face? Well, that's how Freddy's Elizabeth looked. Well, she said, and her teeth gave a little click. I gulped. Then I said it was nothing. Then I said it was nothing much. Then I said, oh, well, it was this way. And I told her all about it. And all the while, idiot Freddy stood there gaping without a word. Not one solitary yip had he let out of himself from the start. And the girl didn't speak either. She just stood listening. And then she began to laugh. I never heard a girl laugh so much. She leaned against the side of the veranda and shrieked. And all the while, Freddy, the world's champion dumb brick, standing there, saying nothing. Well, I finished my story and sidled to the steps. I'd said all I had to say, and it seemed to me that about here the stage direction Exit cautiously was written in my part. I gave poor old Freddy up in despair. If only he'd said a word, it might have been all right. But there he stood, speechless. Just out of sight of the house, I met Jeeves returning from his stroll. Jeeves, I said, all is over. The thing's finished. Poor dear old Freddy has made a complete ass of himself and killed the whole show. Indeed, sir? What has actually happened? I told him. He fluffed in his lines, I concluded. Just stood there saying nothing when, if ever there was a time for eloquence, this was it. He... Uh, great God! Look! We had come back within view of the cottage, and there in front of it stood six children, a nurse, two loafers, another nurse, and the fellow from the grocer's. They were all staring... Down the road came galloping five more children, a dog, three men and a boy, all about to stare. And on our porch, as unconscious of the spectators as if they'd been alone in the Sahara, stood Freddy and his Elizabeth, clasped in each other's arms. Great Scott, I said. It would appear, sir, said Jeeves, that everything has concluded most satisfactorily after all. Oh, yes. Yes, <laughs> dear old Freddy may have been fluffy in his lines, I said, but his business certainly seems to have gone with a bang. Very true, sir, said Jeeves. Jeeves, sir, I thought we might drag in my old chum Reggie Pepper at this point. When it comes to storytelling, he has a lot of, um, uh... Savoir-faire, sir. Hmm? Uh, well, possibly some rain later. Now, where was I? Mr. Pepper, sir. Oh, yes. I'm not sure his style is quite up to mine as a, a rack... Um, um, uh, rack... Raconteur, sir. Uh, no, thanks. Not now. I'm trying to get on with this next story, Jeeves. So, uh, let's get old Reggie off the starting block with that tale about Bobby Cardew and his fearful lack of... Uh, 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 what was it? Memory, sir. Oh, yes, you're quite right, Jeeves. <laughs> Spot on. He couldn't remember a thing. 
Well, except, of course, really important stuff, like the cash he'd lost betting on the Cheltenham Gold Cup and that sort of caper. Horse racing, you see, Jeeves, can be... Uh, <clears throat> uh, yes, Jeeves? Uh, might I suggest that I now announce Mr. Pepper's reminiscence, sir? Oh, right. Oh, uh, yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, off you go, Jeeves. I'm obliged to you, sir. Mr. Reginald Pepper with absent treatment. I want to tell you all about dear old Bobby Cardew. It's a most interesting story. I can't put it in any literary style and all that, but I don't have to, don't you know, because it goes on its moral lesson. If you're a man, you mustn't miss it, because it'll be a warning to you. And if you're a woman, well, you won't want to, because it's all about how a girl made a man feel pretty well fed up with things. If you're a recent acquaintance of Bobby's, you'll probably be surprised to hear that there was a time when he was more remarkable for the weakness of his memory than anything else. Dozens of fellows who've only met Bobby since the change took place have been surprised when I told them that. Yet it's true. Believe me. In the days when I first knew him, Bobby Cardew was about the most pronounced young rotter inside the four-mile radius. People have called me a silly ass, but I was never in the same class with Bobby. <laughs> when it came to being a silly ass, he was a plus four man, while my handicap was about six. <laughs> Why, if I wanted him to dine with me, I used to post him a letter at the beginning of the week, and then the day before send him a telegram and a phone call on the day itself, and half an hour before the time we'd fixed, a messenger in a taxi, whose business it was to see that he got in and that the chauffeur had the address all correct. By doing that, I generally managed to get him, unless he'd left town before my messenger arrived. The funny thing was that he wasn't altogether a fool in other ways. Deep down in him, there was a kind of stratum of sense. I'd known him once or twice, shown almost human intelligence. But to reach that stratum, mind you, you needed dynamite. At least, that's what I thought. But there was another way which hadn't occurred to me. Marriage, I mean. Marriage, the dynamite of the soul. That was what hit Bobby. He married. Have you ever seen a bull pup chasing a bee? The pup sees the bee. It looks good to him. But he doesn't know what's at the end of it till he gets there. I was like that with Bobby. He fell in love, got married, with a sort of whoop, as if it were the greatest fun in the world and then began to find out things. She wasn't the sort of girl you would have expected Bobby to rave about. And yet, I don't know. What I mean is, she worked for her living, and to a fellow who's never done a hand's turn in his life, there's undoubtedly a sort of fascination, a kind of romance, about a girl who works for her living. Her name was Antony, Mary Antony. She was about five feet six. She had a ton and a half of red-gold hair, grey eyes, and one of those determined chins. She was a hospital nurse. When Bobby smashed himself up at Polo, she was told off by the authorities to smooth his brow and rally round with cooling unguents and all that. And the old boy hadn't been up and about again for more than about a week before they popped off to the registrars and fixed it up. Quite the romance. Bobby broke the news to me at the club one evening, and next day he introduced me to her. I admired her. I've never worked myself. Oh, uh, my name's Pepper, by the way. Did they mention that? Yeah, Reggie Pepper. Uh, my Uncle Edward was Pepper Wells and Co., the colliery people. Yeah, he left me a sizable chunk of bullion. I say, I I've never worked myself, but I admire anyone who earns a living under difficulties, especially a girl. And this girl had had a rather unusually tough time of it, being an orphan and all that, and having had to do everything off her own bat for years. Mary and I got along together splendidly. We don't now, but we'll come to that later. I'm speaking of the past. She seemed to think Bobby the greatest thing on earth, judging by the way she looked at him when she thought I wasn't noticing. And Bobby seemed to think the same about her so that I came to the conclusion that if only dear old Bobby didn't forget to go to the wedding, they had a sporting chance of being quite happy. 
Well, let's brisk it up a bit here and jump a year. Uh, actually, the story doesn't really start till then. They took a flat and settled down. I was in and out of the place quite a good deal. I kept my eyes open, and everything seemed to me to be running along as smoothly as you could want. If this was marriage, I thought, I couldn't see why fellows were so frightened of it. There were a lot of worse things that could happen to a man. But we now come to the incident of the quiet dinner, and it's just here that love's young dream hits a snag, and things begin to occur. I happened to meet Bobby in Piccadilly, and he asked me to come back to dinner at the flat. And like a fool, instead of bolting and putting myself under police protection, I went. When we got to the flat, there was Mrs. Bobby looking... Well, <laughs> I tell you, it staggered me. Her gold hair was all piled up in waves and crinkles and things, with a, um, what you call it, of diamonds in it. And she was wearing the most perfectly ripping dress. Well, I couldn't begin to describe it. I can only say it was the limit. It struck me that if this was how she was in the habit of looking every night when they were dining quietly at home together, it was no wonder that Bobby liked domesticity. Oh, here's old Reggie, dear, said Bobby. I've brought him home to have a bit of dinner. I'll phone down to the kitchen and ask them to send it up now. What? She stared at him as if she'd never seen him before. Then she turned scarlet. Then she turned as white as a sheet. Then she gave a little laugh. That was most interesting to watch. It made me wish I was up a tree about 800 miles away. Then she recovered herself. I'm so glad you were able to come, Mr. Pepper, she said, smiling at me. And after that, she was all right. At least you would have said so. She talked a lot at dinner, and chaffed Bobby, and played us ragtime on the piano afterwards, as if she hadn't a care in the world. Quite a jolly little party it was. <laughs> Not. I'm no lynx-eyed sleuth and all that sort of thing, but I had seen her face at the beginning, and I knew that she was working the whole time, and working hard, to keep herself in hand, and that she would have given that diamond what's-its-name in her hair, and everything else she possessed, to have one good scream, just one. I've sat through some pretty thick evenings in my time, but that one had the rest beaten in a canter. At the very earliest moment, I grabbed my hat and got away. Having seen what I did, I wasn't particularly surprised to meet Bobby at the club next day, looking about as merry and bright as a lonely gumdrop at an Eskimo tea party. He started in straight away. He seemed glad to have someone to talk to about it. Do you know how long I've been married? He said. I didn't, exactly. About a year, isn't it? Not about a year, he said, sadly. Exactly a year. Yesterday. Then I understood. I saw light. A regular flash of light. Yesterday was the anniversary of the wedding. I'd arranged to take Mary to the Savoy and on to Covent Garden, if she particularly wanted to hear Caruso. I had the ticket for the box in my pocket. Do you know, Reggie, all through dinner, I had a kind of rummy idea that there was something I'd forgotten, but I couldn't think what. Till your wife mentioned it. He nodded. She um, mentioned it, he said thoughtfully. Well, I didn't ask for details. Women with hair and chins like Mary's may be angels most of the time, but when they take off their wings for a bit, they aren't half-hearted about it. To be absolutely frank, old top, said poor old Bobby in a broken sort of way, my stock's pretty low at home. I didn't see much to be done. I just lit a cigarette and sat there. He didn't want to talk, and presently he went out. I stood at the window of our upper smoking room, which looks out onto Piccadilly, and watched him. He walked slowly along for a few yards, stopped, then walked on again, and finally turned into a jeweller's, which was an instance of what I meant when I said that deep down in him there was a certain stratum of sense. It was from now on that I began to be really interested in this problem of Bobby's married life. 
Of course, one's always mildly interested in one's friends' marriages, hoping they'll turn out well and all that. But this was different. The average man isn't like Bobby, and the average girl isn't like Mary. It was that old business of the immovable mass and the irresistible force. There was Bobby, ambling gently through life, a dear old chap in a hundred ways, but undoubtedly a chump of the first water. And there was Mary, determined that he shouldn't be a chump. And nature, mind you, on Bobby's side. When nature makes a chump like dear old Bobby, she's proud of him and doesn't want her handiwork disturbed. She gives him a sort of natural armour to protect him against outside interference. And that armour is shortness of memory. Shortness of memory keeps a man a chump when, but for it, he might cease to be one. Well, take my case, for instance. I'm a chump. Well, if I'd remembered half the things people have tried to teach me during my life, my size in hats would be about number nine. But I didn't. I forgot them. And it was just the same with Bobby. For about a week, perhaps a bit more, the recollection of that quiet little domestic evening bucked him up like a tonic. Elephants, I read somewhere, are champions of the memory business, but they were fools compared to Bobby during that week. But, bless you, the shock wasn't nearly big enough. It had dinted the armour, but it hadn't made a hole in it. Pretty soon he was back at the old game. It was pathetic, don't you know? The poor girl loved him, and she was frightened. It was the thin end of the wedge, you see, and she knew it. A man who forgets what day he was married, when he's been married one year, will forget at about the end of the fourth that he's married at all. If she meant to get him in hand at all, she'd got to do it now before he began to drift away. I saw that clearly enough, and I tried to make Bobby see it when he was by way of pouring out his troubles to me one afternoon. I can't remember what it was that he'd forgotten the day before, but it was something she'd asked him to bring home for her. Well, it may have been a book. It's such a little thing to make a fuss about, said Bobby, and she knows that it's simply because I've got such an infernal memory about everything. I can't remember anything. Never could. He talked on for a while, and just as he was going, he pulled out a couple of sovereigns. Oh, uh, by the way, he said, oh, What's this for? I asked, though I knew. I owe it to you. Well, how's that? I said. Why, that bet on Tuesday, in the billiard room, Murray and Brown were playing a hundred up, and I gave you two to one that Brown would win, and Murray beat him by twenty-odd. Ah, oh, so you remember some things, I said. He got quite excited, said that if I thought he was the sort of rotter who forgot to pay when he lost a bet, it was pretty rotten of me after knowing him all these years, and a lot more like that. <laughs> subside, laddie, subside, I said. And then I spoke to him like a father. What you've got to do, my old college chum, I said, is to pull yourself together and, and jolly quick, too. As things are shaping, you're due for a nasty knock before you know what's hit you. You've got to make an effort. No, 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 don't say you can't. This two-quid business shows that even if your memory is rocky, you can remember some things. Now, what you've got to do is to see that wedding anniversaries and so on are included in the list. It may be a brain strain, but you can't get out of it. Oh, well, I suppose you're right, said Bobby. But it beats me why she thinks such a lot of these rotten little dates. What's it matter if I forget what day we were married on, or what day she was born on, or what day the cat had the measles? She knows I love her just as much as if I were a memorizing freak at the halls. That's not enough for a woman, I said. They want to be shown. Bear that in mind, and you're all right. Forget it, and there'll be trouble. He chewed the knob of his stick. Women are frightfully rummy, he said gloomily. You should have thought of that before you married one, I said. I don't see that I could have done any more. I'd put the whole thing in a nutshell for him. You'd have thought he'd have seen the point, and that it would have made him brace up and get a hold on himself. But no, off he went again in the same old way. <laughs> I gave up arguing with him. 
I had a good deal of time on my hands, but not enough to amount to anything when it was a question of reforming dear old Bobby by argument. If you see a man asking for trouble and insisting on getting it, the only thing to do is to stand by and wait till it comes to him. After that, you may get a chance, but till then, there's nothing to be done. But I thought a lot about him. Bobby didn't get into the soup all at once. Weeks went by, and months, and still nothing happened. Now and then he'd come into the club with a kind of cloud on his shining morning face, and I'd know that there'd been doings in the home. But it wasn't till well on in the spring that he got the thunderbolt just where he'd been asking for it, in the thorax. I was smoking a quiet cigarette one morning in the window looking out over Piccadilly, and watching the buses and motors going up one way and down the other. Most interesting it is, I often do it. When in rushed Bobby, with his eyes bulging and his face the colour of an oyster, waving a piece of paper in his hand. Reggie, he said, Reggie, old top, she's gone. Gone, I said. Who? Mary, of course, gone, left me, gone. Where, I said. Silly question. <laughs> Perhaps you're right. Anyhow, dear old Bobby nearly foamed at the mouth. Where? How should I know where? Here, read this. And he pushed the paper into my hand. It was a letter. Go on, said Bobby. Read it. So I did. It was certainly quite a letter. There wasn't much of it, but it was all to the point. This is what it said. My dear Bobby, I am going away. When you care enough about me to remember to wish me many happy returns on my birthday, I will come back. My address will be Box 341, London Morning News. I read it twice. Then I said, Well, why don't you? Why don't I what? Why don't you wish her many happy returns? Doesn't seem much to ask. But she says on her birthday. Well, when is her birthday? Can't you understand? I've forgotten. Forgotten? I said. Yes, said Bobby. Forgotten. Well, how do you mean, forgotten? I said. Forgotten whether it's the 20th or the 21st or what? How near do you get to it? I know it came somewhere between the 1st of January and the 31st of December. That's how near I get to it. Well, think. Think? What's the use of saying think? Think I haven't thought? I've been knocking sparks out of my brain ever since I opened that letter. And you can't remember? No. I rang the bell and ordered restoratives. Well, Bobby, I said, it's a pretty hard case to spring on an untrained amateur like me. I suppose someone had come to Sherlock Holmes and said, Mr. Holmes, here's a case for you. When is my wife's birthday? Wouldn't that have given Sherlock a jolt? However, I know enough about the game to understand that a fellow can't shoot off his deductive theories unless you start him off with a clue. So rouse yourself out of that pop-eyed trance and come across with two or three. For instance, can't you remember the last time she had a birthday? What sort of weather was it? That might fix the month. Bobby shook his head. It was just ordinary weather, as near as I can recollect. Warm? Warmish? Or cold? Well, fairly cold, perhaps. I can't remember. I ordered two more of the same. They seemed indicated in the young detective's manual. You're a great help, Bobby, I said. An invaluable assistant. One of those indispensable adjuncts without which no home is complete. Bobby seemed to be thinking. I've got it, he said suddenly. Look here, I gave her a present on her last birthday. All we have to do is go to the shop, hunt up the date when it was bought, and the thing's done. Absolutely. What did you give her? He sagged. I can't remember, he said. Getting ideas is like golf. Some days you're right off it, others it's as easy as falling off a log. I don't suppose dear old Bobby had ever had two ideas in the same morning before in his life, but now he did it without an effort. He just loosed another dry martini into the undergrowth, and before you could turn round, it had flushed quite a brainwave. 
Do you know those little books called When You Were Born? There's one for each month. They tell you your character, your talents, your strong points and your weak points at fourpence halfpenny a go. Bobby's idea was to buy the whole twelve and go through them till we found out which month hit off Mary's character. That would give us the month and narrow it down a whole lot. A pretty hot idea for a non-thinker like dear old Bobby. Well, we sallied out at once. He took half and I took half and we settled down to work. As I say, it sounded good. But when we came to go into the thing, we saw that there was a flaw. Oh, there was plenty of information, all right. But there wasn't a single month that didn't have something that exactly hit off Mary. Uh, for instance, in the December book, it said, December people are apt to keep their own secrets. They are extensive travellers. Well, Mary had certainly kept her secret, and she'd travelled quite extensively enough for Bobby's needs. Then October people were born with original ideas and loved moving. You couldn't have summed up Mary's little jaunt more neatly. February people had wonderful memories, Mary's speciality. We took a bit of a rest, then had another go at the thing. Bobby was all for May, because the book said that women born in that month were inclined to be capricious, which is always a barrier to a happy married life. But I plumbed for February, because February women are unusually determined to have their own way, are very earnest, and expect a full return in their companions or mates. Which he owned was about as like Mary as anything could be. In the end he tore the books up, stamped on them, burnt them, and went home. It was wonderful what a change the next few days made in dear old Bobby. Have you ever seen that picture, The Soul's Awakening? It represents a flapper of sorts, gazing in a startled sort of way into the middle distance, with a look in her eyes that seems to say, Surely that is George's step I hear on the mat. Can this be love? Well, Bobby had a soul's awakening, too. Well, I don't suppose he'd ever troubled to think in his life before. Not really think. But now he was wearing his brain to the bone. It was painful in a way, of course, to see a fellow human being so thoroughly in the soup, but I felt strongly that it was all for the best. I could see as plainly as possible that all these brainstorms were improving Bobby out of knowledge. When it was all over, he might possibly become a rotter again of a sort, but it would only be a pale reflection of the rotter he had been. It bore out the idea I'd always had that what he needed was a real good jolt. I saw a great deal of him these days. Well, I was his best friend, and he came to me for sympathy. I gave it him, too, with both hands, but I never failed to hand him the moral lesson when I had him weak. One day he came to me as I was sitting in the club, and I could see that he had had an idea. He looked happier than he'd done in weeks. Reggie, he said, I'm on the trail. This time I'm convinced that I shall pull it off. I've remembered something of vital importance. Yes, I said. I remember distinctly that on Mary's last birthday we went together to the Coliseum. How does that hit you? Well, oh, it was a fine bit of memorising, I said. But how does it help? Why, they change the programme every week there. Ah, I said. Now you are talking, and the week we went, one of the turns was Professor Someone's Terpsichorean Cats. I recollect them distinctly. Now, are we narrowing it down, or aren't we? Reggie, I'm going round to the Colosseum this minute, and I'm going to dig the date of those Terpsichorean cats out of them if I have to use a crowbar. So that got him within six days, for the management treated us like brothers, brought out the archives and ran agile fingers over the pages till they treed the cats in the middle of May. I told you it was May, said Bobby. Maybe you'll listen to me another time. If you've any sense, I said, there won't be another time. And Bobby said that there wouldn't. Once you get your memory on the run... It parts, as if it enjoyed doing it. I had just got off to sleep that night, and my telephone bell rang. 
It was Bobby, of course. He didn't apologise. Reggie, he said, I've got it now for certain. It's just come to me. We saw those Terpsichorean cats at a matinee, old man. Um, yes, I said. Well, don't you see that that brings it down to two days? It must have been either Wednesday the 7th or Saturday the 10th. Oh, yes, I said. If they didn't have daily matinees at the Coliseum. I heard him give a sort of howl. Bobby, I said. My feet were freezing, but I was fond of him. Well, I've remembered something, too. It's this. The day you went to the Coliseum, I lunched with you both at the Ritz. You'd forgotten to bring any money with you, so you wrote a check. Oh, but I'm always writing checks. You are. But this was for a tenner and made out to the hotel. Hunt up your checkbook and see how many checks for ten pounds payable to the Ritz Hotel you wrote out between May the 5th and May the 10th. He gave a kind of gulp. Richie, he said, you're a genius. I've always said so. I believe you've got it. Hold the line. Presently he came back again. Hello, he said. I'm here, I said. It was the eighth, Richie, old man. I, I... Topping, I said. Topping. <laughs> Good night. It was working along into the small hours now, but I thought I might as well make a night of it and finish the thing up. So I rang up an hotel near the Strand. Put me through to Mrs. Cardew, I said. It's late, said the man at the other end. And getting later every minute, I said. Buck along, laddie. I waited patiently. I'd missed my beauty sleep, and my feet had frozen hard, but I was past regrets. What is the matter? said Mary's voice. My feet are cold, I said, but I didn't call you up to tell you that particularly. I've just been chatting with Bobby, Mrs. Cardew. Oh, oh, is that Mr. Pepper? Yes, he's remembered it, Mrs. Cardew. She gave a sort of scream. I've often thought how interesting it must be to be one of those exchange girls. The things they must hear, don't you know? Bobby's howl and gulp, and Mrs. Bobby's scream, and all about my feet and all that. Most interesting it must be. He, he's remembered it? She gasped. Did you tell him? No. Well, I hadn't. Mr. Pepper? Yes? Was he... has he been... Was he very worried? I chuckled. This was where I was billed to be the life and soul of the party. Worried? <laughs> he was about the most worried man between here and Edinburgh. He's been worrying as if he was paid to do it by the nation. He has started out to worry after breakfast and... Oh, well, you can never tell with women. My idea was that we should pass the rest of the night slapping each other on the back across the wire and telling each other what bally, brainy conspirators we were, don't you know, and all that. But I'd got just as far as this when she bit at me. Absolutely. I heard the snap. And then she said, Oh! in that choked kind of way. And when a woman says, Oh! like that, it means all the bad words she'd love to say if she only knew them. And then she began. What brutes men are! What horrid brutes! How you could stand by and see poor dear Bobby worrying himself into a fever when a word from you would have put everything right, I can't... But, but... And you call yourself his friend? His friend? Ha! <laughs> Metallic laugh, most unpleasant. It shows how one can be deceived. I used to think you a kind-hearted man. But, 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 I say, when I suggested the thing, you thought it perfectly... I thought it hateful, abominable. But you said it was absolutely top... I said nothing of the kind. And if I did, I didn't mean it. I don't wish to be unjust, Mr. Pepper. But I must say that to me there seems to be something positively fiendish in a man who could go out of his way to separate a husband from his wife simply in order to amuse himself by gloating over his agony. But when one single word would have... But, but you made me promise not to, 
I bleated. And if I did, do you suppose I didn't expect you to have the sense to break your promise? I had finished. I had no further observations to make. I hung up the receiver and crawled into bed. I still see Bobby when he comes to the club, but I do not visit the old homestead. He's friendly, but he stops short of issuing invitations. I ran across Mary at the academy last week, and her eyes went through me like a couple of bullets through a pat of butter. And as they came out the other side, and I limped off to piece myself together again, there occurred to me the simple epitaph which, when I am no more, I intend to have inscribed on my tombstone. It was this. He was a man who acted from the best motives. There is one born every minute. I say, Jeeves. Sir? I was thinking. Indeed, sir. Yes, what's the most extraordinary tale you've ever heard from the lips of one of my fellow club members? Well, sir, since you inquire, might I vouchsafe the opinion that the circumstances that befell your friend Mr. George Latiker in Monte Carlo would answer favourably to that description. Good heavens! A hole in one, Jeeves! Yes, quite a remarkable situation. Uh, 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 what exactly was it that occurred? If memory serves me correctly, I venture to think that Mr. Latiker's adventure took place on board a seagoing vessel moored in the harbour, sir. Dash it all, Jeeves! Bullseye again! On old Marshall's yacht! Precisely, sir. Though I regret to state that the affair commenced with what I can only describe as the reprehensible behaviour of a member of my own calling, sir. A butler? A gentleman's personal gentleman, sir. By the name of Vools, who... Ah, ah yes, Jeeves, yes. Uh, I catch your drift. Not exactly a credit to the noble art of valeting, eh? I fear not, sir. Yes, it all comes galloping back to me now. Old Reggie Pepper had wangled himself an invitation and witnessed the whole thing. Indeed, sir. Well, over to Reggie, Jeeves. Splice the main brace. I beg your pardon, sir. Now go on, shiver your timbers, swing the champers, and get old Reggie launched. Certainly, sir. May I introduce Mr. Pepper, rallying round old George. I think one of the rummiest affairs I was ever mixed up in, in the course of a lifetime devoted to butting into other people's business, was that affair of George Latiker at Monte Carlo. I wouldn't bore you, don't you know, for the world, but I think you ought to hear about it. We'd come to Monte Carlo on the yacht Circe, belonging to an old sportsman of the name of Marshall. Among those present were myself, my man Vools, a Mrs. Vanderley, her daughter Stella, Mrs. Vanderley's maid Pillbeam, and George. George was a dear old pal of mine, came from an old Edinburgh family, pots of ancestors, but not a lot in the treasury, if you know what I mean. In fact, it was I who'd worked him into the party. You see, George was due to meet his Uncle Augustus, who was scheduled, George having just reached his twenty-fifth birthday, to hand over to him a legacy left by one of George's aunts, for which he'd been trustee. The aunt had died when George was quite a kid. It was a date that George had been looking forward to, for though he had a sort of income, an income is, after all, only an income, whereas a chunk of O'Goblins is a pile. George's uncle was in Monte Carlo, and had written George that he'd come to London and unbelt. But it struck me that a far better plan was for George to go to his uncle at Monte Carlo instead. Kill two birds with one stone, don't you know? Fix up his affairs and have a pleasant holiday simultaneously. So George had tagged along, and at the time when the trouble started, we were anchored in Monaco Harbour, and Uncle Augustus was due next day. Looking back, I may say that, uh, so far as I was mixed up in it, 
The thing began at seven o'clock in the morning, when I was aroused from a dreamless sleep by the dickens of a scrap in progress outside my stateroom door. The chief ingredients were a female voice that sobbed and said, Oh, Harold, and a male voice raised in anger, as they say, which, after considerable difficulty, I identified as Vools's. I hardly recognized it. In his official capacity, Vools talks exactly like you'd expect a statue to talk, if it could. In private, however, he evidently relaxed to some extent, and to have that sort of thing going on in my midst at that hour was too much for me. Vools! I yelled. Spion Cop ceased with a jerk. There was silence, then sobs diminishing in the distance, and finally a tap at the door. Vools entered with that impassive, my lord, the carriage waits look, which is what I pay him for. You wouldn't have believed he had a drop of any sort of emotion in him. Vools, I said, are you under the delusion that I'm going to be Queen of the May? You've called me early, all right. It's only just seven. I understood you to summon me, sir. Well, I summoned you to find out why you were making that infernal noise outside. I owe you an apology, sir. I'm afraid that in the heat of the moment, I raised my voice. Well, it's a wonder you didn't raise the roof. Who was that with you? Miss Pillbeam, sir. Mrs. Vanderley's maid. Well, what was all the trouble about? I was breaking our engagement, sir. I couldn't help gaping. Well, somehow one didn't associate vools with engagements. Then it struck me that I'd no right to butt in on his secret sorrows, so I switched the conversation. I think I'll get up, I said. Yes, sir. I can't wait to breakfast with the rest. Can you get me some right away? Yes, sir. So I had a solitary breakfast and went up on deck to smoke. It was a lovely morning. Blue sea, gleaming casino, cloudless sky, and all the rest of the hippodrome. Presently the others began to trickle up. Stella Vanderley was one of the first. I thought she looked a bit pale and tired. She said she hadn't slept well. Oh, that accounted for it. Unless you get your eight hours, where are you? Seen George? I asked. I couldn't help thinking the name seemed to freeze her a bit, which was queer, because all the voyage she and George had been particularly close pals. In fact, at any moment I expected George to come to me and slip his little hand in mine and whisper, I've done it, old scout, she loves me. I have not seen Mr. Latticer, she said. Oh, I didn't pursue the subject. George's stock was apparently low that a.m. The next item in the day's programme occurred a few minutes later when the morning papers arrived. Mrs. Vanderley opened hers and gave a scream. Oh, the poor dear prince, she said. What a shocking thing, said old Marshall. I knew him in Vienna, said Mrs. Vanderley. He waltzed divinely. Then I got at mine and saw what they were talking about. The paper was full of it. It seemed that late the night before, His Serene Highness, the Prince of saxburg Liegnitz, um, I always wonder why they call these chaps Serene, had been murderously assaulted in a dark street on his way back from the casino to his yacht. Apparently he'd developed the habit of going about without an escort, and some roughneck, taking advantage of this, had laid for him and slugged him with considerable vim. The prince had been found lying pretty well beaten up and insensible in the street by a passing pedestrian, and had been taken back to his yacht, where he still lay unconscious. Oh, this is going to do somebody no good, I said. What do you get for slugging a serene highness? I wonder if they'll catch the fellow. Later, read old Marshall, the pedestrian who discovered His Serene Highness proves to have been Mr. Denman Sturgis, the eminent private investigator. 
Mr. Sturgis has offered his services to the police and is understood to be in possession of a most important clue. Oh, that's the fellow who had charge of that kidnapping case in Chicago. If anyone can catch the man, he can. About five minutes later, just as the rest of them were going to move off to breakfast, a boat hailed us and came alongside. A tall, thin man came up the gangway. He looked round the group and fixed on old Marshall as the probable owner of the yacht. Good morning, he said. I believe you have a Mr. Latiker on board? Mr. George Latiker? Uh, yes, yes, he, he, he's down below. You want to see him? Whom shall I say? He wouldn't know my name. I should like to see him for a moment on somewhat urgent business. Oh, oh take a seat. He'll be up in a moment. Uh, Reggie, my boy, go and hurry him up. I went down to George's stateroom. Uh, George, old man, I shouted. No answer. I opened the door and went in. The room was empty. What's more, the bunk hadn't been slept in. I don't know when I've been more surprised. I went on deck. He isn't there, I said. Not there? said old Marshall. Not the... Oh, where is he, then? Perhaps he's gone for a stroll ashore. But he'll be back soon for breakfast. Um, you'd better wait for him. Have you breakfasted? No? Then will you join us? The man said he would, and just then the gong went, and they trooped down, leaving me alone on deck. I sat smoking and thinking and then smoking a bit more, when I thought I heard somebody call my name in a sort of hoarse whisper. I looked over my shoulder, and by Joe, there at the top of the gangway, in evening dress, dusted to the eyebrows, and without a hat, was dear old George. Great Scott! I cried. Shush! Shush! he whispered. Anyone about? They're all down at breakfast. He gave a sigh of relief, sank into my chair, and closed his eyes. I regarded him with pity. The poor old boy looked a wreck. I say, I said, touching him on the shoulder. He leapt out of the chair with a smothered yell. Did you do that? What did you do it for? What's the sense of it? How do you suppose you can ever make yourself popular if you go about touching people on the shoulder? My nerves are sticking a yard out of my body this morning. Reggie! Yes, old boy. I did a murder last night. What? It's the sort of thing that might happen to anybody. Directly Stella Vanderley broke off our engagement, I... Broke off your engagement? Well, how long were you engaged? About two minutes. It may have been less. I hadn't a stopwatch. I proposed to her at ten last night in the saloon. She accepted me. I was just going to kiss her... When we heard someone coming, I went out. Coming along the corridor was that infernal, what's her name, Mrs. Vandalis maid, Pillbeam. Have you ever been accepted by the girl you love, Reggie? Never. I've been refused. Doesn't. Then you won't understand how I felt. I was off my head with joy. I hardly knew what I was doing. I, I just felt I had to kiss the nearest thing handy. I couldn't wait. It might have been the ship's cat. It wasn't. It was Pillbeam. You kissed her? I, I kissed her. And just at that moment, the door of the saloon opened, and out came Stella. Great Scott! Exactly what I said. It flashed across me that to Stella, dear girl, not knowing the circumstances, the thing might seem a little odd. It did. She broke off the engagement, and I got out the dinghy and rode off. I was mad. I... I didn't care what became of me. I simply wanted to forget. I went ashore. I, I, it's just on the cards that I may have drowned my sorrows a bit. Anyhow, I don't remember a thing, except that I can recollect having the deuce of a scrap with somebody in a dark street, and somebody falling, and myself legging it for all I was worth. I woke up this morning in the casino gardens. I've lost my hat. I dived for the paper. Read, 
I said. It's all there. He read. Oh, good heavens, he said. You didn't do a thing to his serene nibs, did you? Oh, Reggie, this is awful. Well, cheer up. They say he'll recover. Well, that doesn't matter. Well, it does to him. He read the paper again. It says they've a clue. Oh, they always say that. But m my hat. Eh? My hat. I must have dropped it during the scrap. Uh, this man, Denman Sturgis, must have found it. It had my name in it. George, I said, you mustn't waste time. Oh! He jumped a foot in the air. Don't do it, he said irritably. Don't bark like that. What's the matter? The man. What man? A tall, thin man with an eye like a gimlet. He arrived just before you did. He's down in the saloon now having breakfast. He said he wanted to see you on business and wouldn't give his name. I didn't like the look of him from the first. It's this fellow Sturgis. It must be. No, I feel it. I'm sure of it. Had he a hat? Oh, of course he had a hat. Fool, I mean mine. Was he carrying a hat? By Jove, he was carrying a parcel. George, old scout, you must get a move on. You must light out if you want to spend the rest of your life out of prison. Slugging a serene highness is les majesty. Well, it's worse than hitting a policeman. You haven't got a moment to waste. But I haven't any money. Reggie, old man, lend me a tenner or something. I must get over the frontier into Italy at once. I'll wire my uncle to meet me in... God! I cried. There's someone coming. He dived out of sight just as Vools came up the companionway, carrying a letter on a tray. Uh, what's the matter, Vools? I said. What do you want? Beg your pardon, sir. I thought I heard Mr. Latika's voice. A letter has arrived for him. Uh, well, he isn't here. No, sir. Shall I remove the letter? No, no. Uh, give it to me. I'll give it to him when he comes. Very good, sir. Oh, Wools, uh, are they all still at breakfast? The gentleman who came to see Mr. Latica, still hard at it? He is at present occupied with a kippered herring, sir. Ah, uh, that's all, Wools. Thank you, sir. He retired. I called to George, and he came out. Who was it? Only Wools. He brought a letter for you. Uh, they're all at breakfast still. The sleuths eating kippers. Oh, that'll hold him for a bit, full of bones. He began to read his letter. He gave a kind of grunt of surprise at the first paragraph. Oh, well, I'm hanged, he said, as he finished. Reggie, this is a queer thing. Oh, what's that? He handed me the letter, and directly I started in on it, I saw why he had grunted. This is how it ran. My dear George, I shall be seeing you tomorrow, I hope. But I think it is better, before we meet, to prepare you for a curious situation that has arisen in connection with the legacy which your father inherited from your Aunt Emily, and which you are expecting me, as trustee, to hand over to you now that you have reached your twenty-fifth birthday. You have doubtless heard your father speak of your twin brother Alfred, who was lost or kidnapped, which was never ascertained, when you were both babies. When no news was received of him for so many years, it was supposed that he was dead. Yesterday, however, I received a letter purporting to come from him, in which it was stated that he had been living all this time in Buenos Aires as the adopted son of a wealthy South American, and has only recently discovered his identity. He states that he is on his way to meet me, and will arrive any day now. Of course, like other claimants, he may prove to be an impostor, but meanwhile his intervention will, I fear, cause a certain delay before I can hand over your money to you. It will be necessary to go into a thorough examination of credentials, etc., and this will take some time. But I will go fully into the matter with you when we meet. Your affectionate uncle, 
Augustus Arbart. I read it through twice, and the second time I had one of those ideas I do sometimes get, though admittedly a trump of the premier class. I've seldom had such a thoroughly corking brainwave. Why, old top, I said, this lets you out. Lets me out of half the darned money, if that's what you mean. If this chap's not an impostor, and there's no earthly reason to suppose he is, though I've never heard my father say a word about him, we shall have to split the money. Aunt Emily's will left the money to my father, or failing him, his offspring. I thought that meant me, but apparently there are a crowd of us. I call it rotten work springing unexpected offspring on a fellow at the eleventh hour like this. Why, you chump, I said. It's going to save you. This lets you out of your spectacular dash across the frontier. All you've got to do is stay here and be your brother Alfred. <laughs> it came to me in a flash. <laughs> he looked at me in a kind of dazed way. You ought to be in some sort of home, Reggie. Yes, I cried. <laughs> Don't you understand? Have you ever heard of twin brothers who weren't exactly alike? Who's to say you aren't, Alfred, if you swear you are? Your uncle will be there to back you up, that you have a brother, Alfred. Aye, and Alfred will be there to call me a liar. No, he won't, he won't. It's not as if you had to keep it up for the rest of your life. It's only for an hour or two, till we can get this detective off the yacht. We sail for England tomorrow morning. At last, the thing seemed to sink into him. His face brightened. Why, I really do believe it would work, he said. Of course it would work. If they want proof, show them your mole. I'll swear George hadn't one. And as Alfred, I should get a chance of talking to Stella and making things all right for George. Oh, Reggie, old top, you're a genius. Oh, no, no, you are. Well, it's only sometimes I, I can't keep it up. And just then, there was a gentle cough behind us. We spun round. What the devil are you doing here, fools? I said. I beg your pardon, sir. I have heard all. I looked at George. George looked at me. Fools is all right, I said. Decent fools. Fools wouldn't give us away, would you, fools? Yes, sir. You would? Yes, sir. But fools, old man, I said. Be sensible. What would you gain by it? Financially, sir, nothing. Whereas by keeping quiet, I tapped him on the chest, by holding your tongue, fools, by saying nothing about it to anybody, fools, old fellow, you might gain a considerable sum. Am I to understand, sir, that because you are rich and I am poor, you think that you can buy my self-respect? Oh, come, I said. How much? You said fools. So we switched to terms. You wouldn't believe the way the man haggled. You'd have thought a decent, faithful servant would have been delighted to oblige one in a little matter like that for a fiver. But not fools. By no means. It was a hundred down, and the promise of another hundred when we'd got safely away, before he was satisfied. But we fixed it up at last, and poor old George got down to his stateroom and changed his clothes. He'd hardly gone when the breakfast party came on deck. I say, did you meet him? I asked. Um, meet whom? said old Marshall. George's twin brother, Alfred. Oh, I didn't know George had a brother. But nor did he till yesterday. It's a long story. He was kidnapped in infancy, and everyone thought he was dead. George had a letter from his uncle about him yesterday. I shouldn't wonder if that's where George has gone, to see his uncle and find out about it. In the meantime, Alfred has arrived. He's down in George's stateroom now, having a brush-up. It'll amaze you the likeness between them. You'll think it is George at first. Oh, look, here he comes. And up came George, brushed and clean, in an ordinary yachting suit. They were rattled. There was no doubt about that. 
They stood looking at him as if they thought there was a catch somewhere, but weren't quite certain where it was. I introduced him, and still they looked doubtful. Mr. Pepper tells me my brother is not on board, said George. Ha! Brilliant! Oh, it's an amazing likeness, said old Marshall. Is my brother like me? asked George, amiably. No one could tell you apart, I said. I suppose twins are always alike, said George. But if it ever came to a question of identification, there would be one way of distinguishing us. Do you know George well, Mr. Pepper? He's a dear old pal of mine. You've been swimming with him, perhaps? Every day last August. Well, then, you would have noticed it if he had a mole like this on the back of his neck, wouldn't you? He turned his back and stooped and showed the mole. His collar hid it at ordinary times. I'd seen it often when we were bathing together. Has George a mole like that? he asked. No, I said. Oh, no. You would have noticed it if he had. Yes, I said. Oh, yes. I'm glad of that, said George. It would be a nuisance not to be able to prove one's own identity. And that seemed to satisfy them all. They couldn't get away from it. It seemed to me that from now on the thing was a walkover. And I think George felt the same, for when old Marshall asked him if he'd had breakfast, he said he had not, went below and pitched in as if he hadn't a care in the world. Everything went right till lunchtime. George sat in the shade on the foredeck, talking to Stella most of the time. When the gong went and the rest had started to go below, he drew me back. He was beaming. It's all right, he said. What did I tell you? Um, what did you tell me? Why, about Stella. Didn't I say that Alfred would fix things for George? I told her she looked worried and got her to tell me what the trouble was. And then... Well, you must have shown a flash of speed if he got her to confide in you after knowing you for about two hours. Oh, perhaps I did, said George modestly. I had no notion till I became him what a persuasive sort of chap my brother Alfred was. Anyway, she told me all about it, and I started in to show her that George was a pretty good sort of fellow on the whole who oughtn't to be turned down for what was evidently merely temporary insanity. She saw my point. And it's all right? Absolutely. If only we can produce George. How much longer does that infernal sleuth intend to stay here? He seems to have taken root. Well, I fancy he thinks that you're bound to come back sooner or later, and he's waiting for you. Oh, he's an absolute nuisance, said George. We were moving towards the companionway to go below for lunch when a boat hailed us. We went to the side and looked over. It's my uncle, said George. A stout man came up the gangway. Hello, George, he said. Get my letter. I think you are mistaking me for my brother, said George. My name is Alfred Latica. What's that? I am George's brother, Alfred. Are you my uncle Augustus? The stout man stared at him. Oh, you're very like, George, he said. So everyone tells me. And you're really Alfred? I am. Well, I'd like to talk business with you for a moment. He cocked his eye at me. I sidled off and went below. At the foot of the companion steps, I met Vools. I beg your pardon, sir, said Vools. If it would be convenient, I should be glad to have the afternoon off. I'm bound to say I rather liked his manner. Absolutely normal, not a trace of the fellow conspirator about it. I gave him the afternoon off. I had lunch. George didn't show up. And as I was going out, I was waylaid by the girl Pillbeam. She'd been crying. 
I beg your pardon, sir, but did Mr. Fools ask you for the afternoon? I didn't see what business it was of hers, but she seemed all worked up about it. So I told her. Yes, I've given him the afternoon off. She broke down. Absolutely collapsed. Devilish unpleasant it was. I'm hopeless in a situation like this. After I'd said, there, there, which didn't seem to help much, I hadn't any remarks to make. He, he said he was going to the tables to gamble away all his savings and then shoot himself because he had nothing left to live for. I suddenly remembered the scrap in the small hours outside my stateroom door. I hate mysteries. I meant to get to the bottom of this. I couldn't have a really first-class valet like Vools going about the place shooting himself up. Evidently, the girl Pillbeam was at the bottom of the thing. I questioned her. She sobbed. I questioned her more. I was firm. And eventually she yielded up the facts. Vools had seen George kiss her the night before. That was the trouble. Things began to piece themselves together. I went up to interview George. There was going to be another job for persuasive Alfred. Vools' mind had got to be eased, as Stella's had been. I couldn't afford to lose a fellow with his genius for preserving a trouser crease. I found George on the foredeck. What is it Shakespeare or somebody says about some fellow's face being sicklied o'er with the pale cast of care? George's was like that. He looked green. Finished with your uncle, I said. He grinned a ghostly grin. There isn't any uncle, he said. There isn't any Alfred. And there isn't any money. Explain yourself, old top, I said. It won't take long. The old crook has spent every penny of the trust money. He's been at it for years, ever since I was a kid. When the time came to cough up and I was due to see that he did it, he went to the tables in the hope of a run of luck and lost the last remnant of the stuff. He had to find a way of holding me for a while and postponing the squaring of accounts while he got away, and he invented this twin brother business. He knew I should find out sooner or later, but meanwhile he'd be able to get off to South America, which he has done. He's on his way now. You let him go? What could I do? I can't afford to make a fuss with that man Sturgis around. I can't prove there's no Alfred when my only chance of avoiding prison is to be Alfred. Well, you've made things right for yourself with Stella Vanderley, anyway, <laughs> I said to cheer him up. What's the good of that now? I've hardly any money and no prospects. How can I marry her? I pondered. It looks to me, old top... I said, at last, as if things were in a bit of a mess. You've guessed it, said poor old George. I spent the afternoon musing on life. If you come to think of it, what a queer thing life is. So unlike anything else, don't you know, if you see what I mean. At any moment... You may be strolling peacefully along, and all the time life's waiting around the corner to fetch you one. You can't tell when you may be going to get it. It's all dashed puzzling. Here was poor old George, as well-meaning a fellow as ever stepped, getting swatted all over the ring by the hand of fate. Why? That's what I asked myself. Just life, don't you know? That's... All there was about it. It was close on six o'clock when our third visitor of the day arrived. We were sitting on the afterdeck in the cool of the evening. Old Marshall, Denman Sturgis, Mrs. Vanderley, Stella, George and I, when he came up. We'd been talking of George, and old Marshall was suggesting the advisability of sending out search parties. He was worried, and so was Stella Vanderley. So, for that matter, were George and I, only not for the same reason. We were just arguing the thing out when the visitor appeared. He was a well-built, stiff sort of fellow. 
he spoke with a German accent. Mr. Marshall, he said, I am Count Fritz von Kurslin, a query to his serene highness. He clicked his heels together and saluted. The Prince of Saxburg Lignitz. Mrs. Vanderley jumped up. Why, Count, she said, what ages since we met in Vienna. You remember? Could I ever forget? And the charming Miss Stella, she is well, I suppose not. Stella, you remember Count Fritz? Stella shook hands with him. And how is the poor dear prince? asked Mrs. Vanderley. What a terrible thing to have happened. I rejoice to say that my highborn master is better. He has regained consciousness and is sitting up and taking nourishment. Oh, oh that's good, said old Marshall. In a spoon only, sighed the Count. Mr. Marshall, with your permission, I should like a word with Mr. Sturgis. Oh. Uh, Mr. Who? The gimlet-eyed sportsman came forward. I am Denman Sturgis, at your service. Oh, the deuce you are. Uh, what are you doing here? Mr. Sturgis, explained the Count, graciously volunteered his services. Oh, I know, I know, but wh wh what's he doing here? I'm waiting for Mr. George Latica, Mr. Marshall. Eh? You have not found him? asked the Count, anxiously. Not yet, Count, but I hope to do so shortly. I, I know what he looks like now. Uh, this gentleman is his twin brother. They are doubles. You are sure this gentleman is not Mr. George Latica? George put his foot down firmly on the suggestion. Don't go mixing me up with my brother, he said. I am Alfred. You can tell me by my mole. He exhibited the mole. He was taking no risks. The Count clicked his tongue regretfully. I am sorry, he said. George didn't offer to console him. Uh, don't worry, said Sturgis. He won't escape me. I shall find him. Do, Mr. Sturgis, do, and quickly. Find swiftly that noble young man. What? shouted George. That noble young man, George Larica, who at the risk of his life saved my highborn master from the assassin. George sat down suddenly. I don't understand, he said feebly. We were wrong, Mr. Sturgis, went on the Count. We leapt to the conclusion, was it not so, that the owner of the hat you found was also the assailant of my highborn master. We were wrong. I have heard the story from his serene highness's own lips. He was passing down a dark street, when a ruffian in a mask sprang out upon him. Doubtless he had been followed from the casino, where he had been winning heavily. My highborn master was taken by surprise. He was felt, but before he lost consciousness, he perceived a young man in evening dress, wearing the hat you found, running swiftly towards him. The hero engaged the assassin in combat, and my highborn master remembers no more. His serene highness asks repeatedly, where is my brave preserver? His gratitude is princely. He seeks for this young man to reward him. Ah, you should be proud of your brother, sir. Oh, uh, thanks, said George limply. And you, Mr. Sturgis, you must redouble your efforts. You must search the land. You must scour the sea to find George Larica. He needn't take all that trouble, said a voice from the gangway. It was Vool's. His face was flushed, his hat was on the back of his head, and he was smoking a fat cigar. I'll tell you where to find George Larica, he shouted. He glared at George, who was staring at him. Yes, look at me, Vool's yelled. Look at me. You won't be the first this afternoon who stared at the mysterious stranger who won for two hours without a break. I'll be even with you now, Mr. Blooming Latica. I'll learn you to break a poor man's heart. Mr. Marshall and gents, this morning I was on deck and I overheard him plotting to put up a game on you. They'd spotted that gent there as a detective 
and they arranged that Blooming Latica was to pass himself off as his own twin brother. And if you wanted proof, Blooming Pepper tells him to show them his mole, and he'd swear George hadn't one. Those were his very words. That man there is George Latica, Esquire, and let him deny it if he can. George got up. I haven't the least desire to deny it, Vools. Mr. Vools, if you please. It's true, said George, turning to the Count. The fact is, I had rather a foggy recollection of what happened last night. I only remembered knocking someone down, and like you, I jumped to the conclusion that I must have assaulted His Serene Highness. Then you are really George Latica? asked the Count. I am. Yeah. What does all this mean? demanded Vools. Merely that I saved the life of His Serene Highness, the Prince of Saxburg Lignitz, Mr. Vools. It's a swindle, began Vools, when there was a sudden rush, and the girl Pilbeam cannoned into the crowd, sending me into Old Marshal's chair, and flung herself into the arms of Vools. Oh, Harold! Harold! she cried. I thought you were dead. I thought you shot yourself. He sort of braced himself together to fling her off, and then he seemed to think better of it, and fell into the clinch. It was all dashed romantic, don't you know, but there are limits. Vools, you're sacked, I said. Who cares? he said. Think I was going to stop on now I'm a gentleman of property? Come along, Emma, my dear. Give a month's notice and get your hat, and I'll take you to dinner at Ciro's. And you, Mr. Ladaker, said the Count, may I conduct you to the presence of my high-born master? He wishes to show his gratitude to his preserver. Aye, you may, said George. Oh, uh, may I have my hat, Mr. Sturgis? Uh, there's just one bit more. After dinner that night, I came up for a smoke, and strolling onto the foredeck, almost bumped into George and Stella. They seemed to be having an argument. I'm not sure, she was saying, that I believe that a man can be so happy that he wants to kiss the nearest thing in sight, as you put it. Or, don't you? said George. Well, as it happens, I'm feeling just that way now. I coughed, and he turned round. Oh, hello, Reggie, he said. Hello, George, I said. Lovely night. Beautiful, said Stella. The moon... I said. Ripping, said George. Lovely, said Stella. And look at the reflection of the stars on the... George caught my eye. Pop off, Reggie, he said. I popped. I say, Jeeves, so, it's a rummy thought... But if there's one thing that absolutely gives me the pip, it's those so-called classic portraits by these modern in-the-school-of Johnnies. Indeed, sir. Indeed, Jeeves. I mean to say, a 500-year-old nude is probably all right, though perish the thought, if you ask me. But a nude slapped on the canvas last Thursday week and the paint hardly dry, so to speak, rather takes the skin off the onion. Very possibly, sir. No, 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 don't get me wrong. So far as art's concerned, Jeeves, I know what I like. Nothing better than those good old country scenes, don't you know? Or a bracing vista of rolling farmland and so on. That constable fellow, for instance, well, he knew how to splash it on. Stout yokels loading the hay and then biffing off to the nearest hostelry for a pint of the county's best. Oh, yes, you can count Bertram in every time on that sort of brushwork. I'm glad to hear it, sir. But it seems to me, if you're forced to clock the rest of the stuff, it's best taken with a large whisky and soda beforehand, a sharp sprint round the National Gallery with no hand signals, and a taxi back to the club for further restoratives afterwards. If I may venture to say so, sir, I believe Mr. Pepper's sentiments on that subject concur precisely with your own. Oh, well, let's hear them then, Jeeves. 
Certainly, sir. Mr. Reggie Pepper recounts doing Clarence a bit of good. Have you ever thought about, and when I say thought about, I mean really carefully considered the question of the coolness, the cheek, or if you prefer it, the gall with which a woman as a sex fairly bursts? I have, by Jove. But then I've had it thrust on my notice, by George, in a way I should imagine has happened to pretty few fellows. And the limit was reached by that business of the Yardsley Venus. To make you understand the full, what you call it, of the situation, I shall have to explain just how matters stood between Mrs. Yardsley and myself. When I first knew her, she was Elizabeth Shulbred, Old Worcestershire family, pots of money, pretty as a picture. Her brother Bill was at Oxford with me. I loved Elizabeth Shulbred. I loved her, don't you know? And there was a time, for about a week, when we were engaged to be married. But just as I was beginning to take a serious view of life and study furniture catalogues and feel pretty solemn when the restaurant orchestra played The Wedding Glide, I'm hanged if she didn't break it off. And a month later she was married to a fellow of the name of Yardsley. Clarence Yardsley, an artist. What with golf and billiards and a bit of racing and fellows at the club rallying round and kind of taking me out of myself, as it were, I got over it and came to look on the affair as a closed page in the book of my life, if you know what I mean. It didn't seem likely to me that we should meet again, as she and Clarence had settled down in the country somewhere and never came to London, and I'm bound to own that by the time I got her letter, the wound had pretty well healed, and I was, to a certain extent, sitting up and taking nourishment. In fact, to be absolutely honest, I was jolly thankful the thing had ended as it had done. Uh, this letter I'm telling you about arrived one morning out of a blue sky, as it were. It ran like this. My dear old Reggie, what ages it seems since I saw anything of you. How are you? We have settled down here in the most perfect old house, with a lovely garden in the middle of delightful country. Couldn't you run down here for a few days? Clarence and I would be so glad to see you. Bill is here and is most anxious to meet you again. He was speaking of you only this morning. Do come. Wire your train, and I will send the car to meet you. Yours most sincerely, Elizabeth Yardsley. P.S. We can give you new milk and fresh eggs. Think of that. P.P.S. Bill says our billiard table is one of the best he has ever played on. P.P.S.S. We are only half a mile from a golf course. Bill says it is better than St. Andrew's. P.P.S.S.S. You must come. Well, a fellow comes down to breakfast one morning with a bit of a head on and finds a letter like that from a girl who might quite easily have blighted his life. It rattled me, rather, I must confess. However, that bit about the golf settled me. I knew Bill knew what he was talking about, and if he said the course was so topping, it must be something special. So I went. Old Bill met me at the station with the car. I hadn't come across him for some months, and I was glad to see him again. And he, apparently, was glad to see me. Thank goodness you've come, he said, as we drove off. I was just about at my last quip. Oh, what's the trouble, Ed Scout? I asked. If I had the artistic what's-his-name, he went on, if the mere mention of pictures didn't give me the pip, I dare say it wouldn't be so bad. As it is, it's one. Pictures? Pictures. Nothing else is mentioned in this household. Clarence is an artist. So is his father. And you know yourself what Elizabeth is like when one gives her her head. I remembered then, it hadn't come back to me before, that most of my time with Elizabeth had been spent in picture galleries. During the period when I'd let her do just what she wanted to do with me, I'd had to follow her like a dog through gallery after gallery, though pictures are poisoned to me, just as they are to old Bill. 
Somehow, it had never struck me that she'd still be going on in this way after marrying an artist. I should have thought that by this time the mere sight of a picture would have fed her up. Not so, however, according to Bill. They talk pictures at every meal, he said. I tell you, it makes a chap feel out of it. How long are you down for? Oh, a few days. Take my tip and let me send you a wire from London. I go there tomorrow. I promised to play against the Scottish. The idea was that I was to come back after the match, but you couldn't get me back with a lasso. I tried to point out the silver lining. But Bill, old scout, your sister says there's a most corking lynx near here. He turned and stared at me and nearly ran us into the bank. You don't mean honestly she said that? Why, she said you said it was better than St. Andrew's. Well, so I did. Was that all she said I said? Well, wasn't it enough? She didn't happen to mention that I added the words, I don't think. No, no, she forgot to tell me that. It's the worst course in Great Britain. I felt rather stunned, don't you know? Whether it's a, a bad habit to have got into or not, I can't say. But I simply can't do without my daily allowance of golf when I'm not in London. I took another whirl at the silver lining. Well, we'll have to take it out in billiards, I said. I'm glad the table's good. Huh, it depends what you call good. It's half size, and there's a seven-inch cut just out of bulk where Clarence's cue slipped. Elizabeth has mended it with pink silk. Very smart and dressy it looks, but it doesn't improve the thing as a billiard table. Well, she said, you said... Mm, must have been pulling your leg. We turned in at the drive gates of a good-sized house standing well back from the road. It looked black and sinister in the dusk, and I couldn't help feeling, you know, like one of those Johnnies you read about in stories who are lured to lonely houses for rummy purposes and hear a shriek just as they get there. Elizabeth knew me well enough to know that a specially good golf course was a safe draw to me, not to mention the billiard table, and she had deliberately played on her knowledge. What was the game? That was what I wanted to know. And then a sudden thought struck me which brought me out in a cold perspiration. She had some girl down here and was going to have a stab at marrying me off. I've often heard that young married women are all over that sort of thing. Certainly she'd said there was nobody at the house but Clarence and herself and Bill and Clarence's father. But a woman who could take the name of St. Andrews in vain, as she had done, wouldn't be likely to stick at a trifle. Bill, old scout... I said. Uh, there aren't any frightful girls or any rot of that sort stopping here, are there? Wish there were, he said. No such luck. As we pulled up at the front door, it opened, and a woman's figure appeared. Have you got him, Bill? she said, which in my present frame of mind struck me as a jolly creepy way of putting it. The sort of thing Lady Macbeth might have said to Macbeth, don't you know? Uh, do you mean me? I said. She came down into the light. It was Elizabeth, looking just the same as in the old days. Is that you, Reggie? I'm so glad you were able to come. I was afraid you might have forgotten all about it. You know what you are. Come along in and have some tea. Have you ever been turned down by a girl who afterwards married and then been introduced to her husband? If so, you'll understand how I felt when Clarence burst on me. You know the feeling. First of all, when you hear about the marriage, you say to yourself, I wonder what he's like. Then you meet him and think, there must be some mistake. She can't have preferred this to me. Well, that's what I thought when I set eyes on Clarence. He was a little, thin, nervous-looking chap of about thirty-five. His hair was getting grey at the temples and straggly on top. He wore pince and he had a drooping moustache. Well, I'm no Bombardier Wells myself, but in front of Clarence I felt quite a nut. And Elizabeth, mind you, is one of those tall, splendid girls who look like princesses. Honestly, I believe women do it out of pure cussedness. How do you do, Mr. Pepper? Hark, can you hear a mewing cat? said Clarence. All in one breath, don't you know? Eh? I said. A mewing cat. I feel sure I hear a mewing cat. Listen. While we were listening, the door opened, 
and a white-haired old gentleman came in. He was built on the same lines as Clarence, but was an earlier model. I took him correctly to be Mr. Yeardsley Senior. Elizabeth introduced us. Father, said Clarence, did you meet a mewing cat outside? I feel positive I heard a cat mewing. No, said the father, shaking his head. No mewing cat. I can't bear mewing cats, said Clarence. A mewing cat gets on my nerves. A mewing cat is so trying, said Elizabeth. I dislike mewing cats, said old Mr. Yardsley. That was all about mewing cats for the moment. They seemed to think they'd covered the ground satisfactorily, and they went back to pictures. We talked pictures steadily till it was time to dress for dinner. At least they did. I just sort of sat around. Presently, the subject of picture robberies came up. Somebody mentioned the Mona Lisa, and then I happened to remember seeing something in the evening paper as I was coming down in the train about some fellow somewhere having had a valuable painting pinched by burglars the night before. It was the first time I'd had a chance of breaking into the conversation with any effect, and I meant to make the most of it. The paper was in the pocket of my overcoat in the hall. I went and fetched it. Here it is, I said, a Romney belonging to Sir Bellamy Palmer. They all shouted, What? Exactly at the same time, like a chorus. Elizabeth grabbed the paper. Let me look. Yes, late last night, burglars entered the residence of Sir Bellamy Palmer, Dryden Park, Midford, Hants. Why, uh, that's near here, I said. I passed through Midford. Dryden Park is only two miles from this house, said Elizabeth. I noticed her eyes were sparkling. Only two miles, she said. It might have been us. It might have been the Venus. Old Mr. Yardsley bounded in his chair. The Venus, he cried. They all seemed wonderfully excited. My little contribution to the evening's chat had made quite a hit. Why I didn't notice it before, I don't know. But it was not till Elizabeth showed it to me after dinner that I had my first look at the Yardsley Venus. When she led me up to it and switched on the light, it seemed impossible that I could have sat right through dinner without noticing it. But then, at meals, my attention is pretty well riveted on the foodstuffs. Anyway, it was not until Elizabeth showed it to me that I was aware of its existence. She and I were alone in the drawing-room after dinner. Old Yardsley was writing letters in the morning-room, while Bill and Clarence were rollicking on the half-sized billiard-table with the pink silk tapestry effects. All, in fact, was joy, jollity, and song, so to speak, when Elizabeth, who'd been sitting wrapped in thought for a bit, bent towards me and said, Reggie. And the moment she said it, I knew something was going to happen. You know that pre-what-you-call-it you get sometimes? Well, I got it then. <laughs> well, what hell? I said, nervously. Reggie, she said, I want to ask a great favour of you. Uh, yes. She stooped down and put a log on the fire and went on with her back to me. Do you remember, Reggie, once saying you would do anything in the world for me? There. You see, that's what I meant when I said that about the cheek of woman as a sex. What I mean is, after what had happened, you'd have thought she would have preferred to let the dead past bury its dead and all that sort of thing. What? Mind you, I had said I would do anything in the world for her. I admit that. But it was a distinctly pre-Clarence remark. He hadn't appeared on the scene then, and it stands to reason that a fellow who may have been a perfect knight-errant to a girl when he was engaged to her doesn't feel nearly so keen on spreading himself in that direction when she's given him the miss in balk and gone and married a man who reason and instinct both tell him is a decided blighter. I couldn't think of anything to say, but... Oh, yes. There's something you can do for me now which will make me everlastingly grateful. Yes, I said. Do you know, Reggie, she said suddenly, that only a few months ago, 
Clarence was very fond of cats. Eh? Well, he still seems, um, interested in them, what? Now they get on his nerves. Everything gets on his nerves. Some fellows swear by that stuff you see advertised all... No, no, that wouldn't help him. He doesn't need to take anything. He wants to get rid of something. I don't quite follow. Get rid of something? The Venus, said Elizabeth. She looked up and caught my bulging eye. You saw the Venus, she said. Not that I remember. Well, come into the dining room. We went into the dining room, and she switched on the lights. There, she said. On the wall, close to the door, that may have been why I hadn't noticed it before, I'd sat with my back to it, was a large oil painting. It was what you'd call a mm, classical picture, I suppose. Uh, what I mean is, well, <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, all I can say is that it's funny I hadn't noticed it. Yeah. Is that the uh, <coughs> Venus? I said. She nodded. How would you like to have to look at that every time you sat down to a meal? Well, I, uh, I don't know. I don't think it would affect me much. I'd worry through all right. She jerked her head impatiently. But you're not an artist, she said. Clarence is. And then I began to see daylight. What exactly was the trouble, I didn't understand, but it was evidently something to do with a good old artistic temperament. And I could believe anything about that. It explains everything. It's like the unwritten law, don't you know, which you plead in America if you've done anything they want to send you to choke you for and you don't want to go. What I mean is, if you're absolutely off your rocker but don't find it convenient to be scooped into the loony bin, you simply explain that when you said you were a teapot, it was just your artistic temperament, and they apologize and go away. So, I stood by to hear just how the... <laughs> A.T. had affected Clarence, the cat's friend, ready for anything. And believe me, it had hit Clarence badly. It was this way. It seemed that old Yardsley was an amateur artist, and that this Venus was his masterpiece. Well, he said so, and he ought to have known. Well, when Clarence married, his father had given it to him as a wedding present, and had hung it where it stood, with his own hands. All right so far, what? But mark the sequel. Temperamental Clarence, being a professional artist, and consequently some streets ahead of the dad at the game, saw flaws in the Venus. He couldn't stand it at any price. He didn't like the drawing. He didn't like the expression of the face. He didn't like the colouring. In fact, it made him feel quite ill to look at it. Yet, being devoted to his father and wanting to do anything rather than give him pain, he'd not been able to bring himself to store the thing in the cellar. And the strain of confronting the picture three times a day had begun to tell on him to such an extent that Elizabeth felt something had to be done. Now, you see, she said. In a way, I said. But don't you think he's making rather heavy weather over a trifle? Oh, can't you understand? Look! Her voice dropped as if she was in church, and she switched on another light. It shone on the picture next to old Yardsley. There, she said. Clarence painted that. She looked at me expectantly, as if she were waiting for me to swoon, or yell, or something. I took a steady look at Clarence's effort. It was another mm, classical picture. It seemed to me very much like the other one. Some sort of art criticism was evidently expected of me, so I made a dash at it. Um, Venus, I said. Mark you, Sherlock Holmes would have made the same mistake. On the evidence, I mean. No, Jock and Spring, she snapped. She switched off the light. I see you don't understand even now. You never had any taste about pictures. When we used to go to the galleries together, you'd far rather have been at your club. This was so absolutely true that I'd no remark to make. She came up to me and put her hand on my arm. I'm sorry, Reggie. I didn't mean to be cross. Only I do want to make you understand that 
Clarence is suffering. Suppose, suppose, well, let us take the case of a great musician. Suppose a great musician had to sit and listen to a cheap, vulgar tune. The same tune, day after day, day after day. Wouldn't you expect his nerves to break? Well, it's just like that with Clarence. Now, you see? Well, uh, yes, but... But what? Surely I've put it plainly enough. Oh, yes, yes, yes. But uh, what I mean is, um, where do I come in? Uh, what do you want me to do? I want you to steal the Venus. I looked at her. You want me to... Steal it. Reggie! Her eyes were shining with excitement. Don't you see? It's Providence. When I asked you to come here, I just got the idea. I knew I could rely on you. And then, by a miracle, this robbery of the Romney takes place at a house not two miles away. It removes the last chance of the poor old man suspecting anything and having his feelings hurt. Why, it's the most wonderful compliment to him. Think. One night, thieves steal a splendid Romney. The next, the same gang take his Venus. It will be the proudest moment of his life. Do it tonight, Reggie. I'll give you a sharp knife. You simply cut the canvas out of the frame, and it's done. Uh, but, um, uh, one moment, I said. I'd be delighted to be of any use to you, but uh, in a purely family affair like this, uh, wouldn't it be better? In fact, um, how about tackling old Bill on the subject? I've asked Bill already. Yesterday. He refused. But if I'm caught, you can't be. All you have to do is to take the picture, open one of the windows, leave it open, and go back to your room. Ah, it sounded simple enough. And um, as to the picture itself, um, when I've got it, burn it. I'll see that you have a good fire in your room. But uh, she looked at me. She always did have the most... Wonderful eyes. Reggie, she said. Nothing more. Just Reggie. She looked at me. Well, after all, if you see what I mean, the days that are no more, don't you know? Old Lang Syne, all that sort of thing. You follow me? All right, I said. I'll do it. I don't know if you happen to be one of those Johnnies who are steeped in crime and so forth, and think nothing of pinching diamond necklaces. If you're not, you'll understand that I felt a lot less keen on the job I'd taken on when I sat in my room waiting to get busy than I had done when I promised to tackle it in the dining room. On paper, it all seemed easy enough, but I couldn't help feeling there was a catch somewhere, and I've never known time pass slower. The kick-off was scheduled for one o'clock in the morning, when the household might be expected to be pretty sound asleep, but at a quarter to, I couldn't stand it any longer. I lit the lantern I'd taken from Bill's bicycle, took a grip of my knife, and slunk downstairs. The first thing I did on getting to the dining room was to open the window. I had half a mind to smash it so as to give an extra bit of local colour to the affair, but decided not to on account of the noise. I had put my lantern on the table and was just reaching out for it when something happened. What it was for the moment I couldn't have said. It might have been an explosion of some sort or an earthquake. Some solid object caught me a frightful whack on the chin. Sparks and things occurred inside my head, and the next thing I remember is feeling something wet and cold splash into my face and hearing a voice that sounded like old Bill's say, Feeling better now? I sat up. The lights were on. I was on the floor with old Bill kneeling beside me with a soda siphon. Oh, um, what happened? I said. I'm awfully sorry, old man, he said. I hadn't a notion it was you. I came in here and saw a lantern on the table and the window open and a chap with a knife in his hand. So I didn't stop to make inquiries. I just let go at his jaw for all I was worth. What on earth do you think you're doing? Are you walking in your sleep? 
It was Elizabeth, I said. Why, you know all about it. She said she'd told you. What? You don't mean... Yes, the picture. You refused to take it on, so she asked me. Wedgie, old man, he said. I'll never believe what they say about repentance again. It's a fool's trick and upsets everything. If I hadn't repented and thought it was rather rough on Elizabeth not to do a little thing like that for her and come down here to do it after all, you wouldn't have stopped that sleep producer with your chin. I'm sorry. <laughs> Me too, I said, giving my head another shake to make certain it was still on. Are you feeling better now? Well, better than I was, but that's not saying much. Would you like some more soda water? No? Well, how about getting this job finished and going to bed? And let's be quick about it, too. You made a noise like a ton of bricks when you went down just now, and it's on the cards some of the servants may have heard. Toss you who carves. Um, heads. Tails it is, he said, uncovering the coin. Up you get. I'll hold the light. Don't spike yourself on that sword of yours. It was as easy a job as Elizabeth had said. Just four quick cuts, and the thing came out of its frame like an oyster. I rolled it up. Old Bill had put the lantern on the floor and was at the sideboard collecting whiskey, soda, and glasses. We've got a long evening before us, he said. You can't burn a picture of that size in one chunk. You'd set the chimney on fire. Let's do the thing comfortably. Clarence can't grudge us the stuff. We've done him a bit of good this trip. Tomorrow will be the maddest, merriest day of Clarence's glad new year. On we go. We went up to my room and sat smoking and yarning away and sipping our drinks, and every now and then cutting a slice off the picture and shoving it in the fire till it was all gone. And what with the coziness of it all, and the cheerful blaze, and the comfortable feeling of doing good by stealth, I don't know when I've had a jollier time since the days when we used to brew in my study at school. We'd just put the last slice on, when Bill sat up suddenly and gripped my arm. I heard something, he said. I listened, and by Jove, I heard something too. My room was just over the dining room, and the sound came up to us quite distinctly. Stealthy footsteps, by George, and then a chair falling over. There's somebody in the dining room, I whispered. There's a certain type of chap who takes a pleasure in positively chivying trouble. Old Bill's like that. If I'd been alone, it would have taken me about three seconds to persuade myself that I hadn't really heard anything after all. I am a peaceful sort of cove, and believe in living and letting live and so forth. To old Bill, however, a visit from burglars was pure jam. He was out of his chair in one jump. Come on, he said. Bring the poker. I brought the tongs as well. I felt like it. Old Bill collared the knife. We crept downstairs. We'll fling the door open and make a rush, said Bill. Um, supposing they shoot, old scout. Burglars never shoot, said Bill, which was comforting, provided the burglars knew it. Old Bill took a grip of the handle, turned it quickly, and in he went. And then we pulled up sharp, staring. The room was in darkness, except for a feeble splash of light at the near end. Standing on a chair in front of Clarence's jock and spring, holding a candle in one hand, and reaching up with a knife in the other, was old Mr. Yardsley, in bedroom slippers and a grey dressing gown. He'd made a final cut just as we rushed in. Turning at the sound, he stopped, and he and the chair and the candle and the picture came down in a heap together. The candle went out. What on earth? said Bill. I felt the same. I picked up the candle and lit it, and then a most fearful thing happened. The old man picked himself up and suddenly collapsed into a chair and began to cry like a child. Of course, I could see it was only the artistic temperament, but still, believe me, it was devilish unpleasant. I looked at old Bill. Old Bill looked at me. We shut the door quick, and after that we didn't know what to do. I saw Bill look at the sideboard, and I knew what he was looking for, but we'd taken the siphon upstairs, 
and his ideas of first aid stopped short at squirting soda water. We just waited, and presently old Yardsley switched off, sat up, and began talking with a rush. Clarence, my boy, I was tempted. It was that burglary at Dryden Park. It tempted me. It made it all so simple. I knew you would put it down to the same gang, Clarence, my boy. I... I... It seemed to dawn upon him at this point that Clarence was not among those present. Uh, uh, Clarence, he said, hesitatingly. He's in bed, I said. In bed? Then he doesn't know? Even now? Oh, oh, young man, I throw myself on your mercy. Don't, don't be hard on me. Listen. He grabbed at Bill, who sidestepped. I can explain everything. Everything. He gave a gulp. You are not artists, you two young men, but I will try to make you understand, make you realize what this picture means to me. I was two years painting it. It is my child. I watched it grow. I loved it. It was part of my life. Nothing would have induced me to sell it. And then Clarence married, and in a mad moment I gave my treasure to him. Oh, you cannot understand, you two young men, what agonies I suffered. The thing was done. It was irrevocable. I saw how Clarence valued the picture. I knew that I could never bring myself to ask him for it back. And yet I was lost without it. What could I do? Till this evening I could see no hope. And then came this story of the theft of the Romney from a house quite close to this. And I saw my way. Clarence would never suspect. He would put the robbery down to the same band of criminals who stole the Romney. Once the idea had come, I could not drive it out. I fought against it. But to no avail, at last I yielded and crept down here to carry out my plan. You found me. He grabbed again at me this time and got me by the arm. He had a grip like a lobster. Young man, young man, you would not betray me. You would not tell Clarence. Well, I was feeling most frightfully sorry for the poor old chap by this time, don't you know? But I thought it would be kindest to give it him straight, instead of breaking it by degrees. I won't say a word to Clarence, Mr. Yardsley, I said. I quite understand your feelings, uh, the artistic temperament and all that sort of thing, I mean. What? <laughs> I know. But I'm, <clears throat> well, I'm afraid, well, <laughs> look. I went to the door and switched on the electric light, and there... Staring him in the face were the two empty frames. He stood goggling at them in silence. Then he gave a sort of wheezy grunt. The, the gang, the burglars, they have been here, and they have taken Clarence's picture. He paused. It might have been mine, my Venus, he whispered. It was getting most fearfully painful, you know, but he had to know the truth. I'm awfully sorry, you know, I said. But it was. He started, poor old chap. <laughs> what? what do you mean? They did take your Venus. No, no, but I have it here. I shook my head. That's Clarence's... Jocund spring, I said. He jumped at it and straightened it out. What? What, what are you talking about? Do you think I don't know my own picture? My child? My Venus? See, my own signature in the corner. Can you read, boy? Look, Matthew Yardsley. This is my picture. And, well, by Jove... It was, don't you know? Well, we got him off to bed, him and his infernal Venus, 
and we settled down to take a steady look at the position of affairs. Bill said it was my fault for getting hold of the wrong picture, and I said it was Bill's fault for fetching me such a crack on the jaw that I couldn't be expected to see what I was getting hold of. And then there was a, well, pretty massive silence for a bit. Wedgie, said Bill, at last, how exactly do you feel about facing Clarence and Elizabeth at breakfast? Old Scout, I said, I was thinking much the same myself. Wedgie, he said Bill, I happen to know there's a milk twain leaving Midford at 3.15. It isn't what you'd call a flyer. It gets to London at about half past nine. Well, uh, in the circumstances, how about it? Well, Jeeves. Sir? There, so to speak, we are. Indeed, sir. The end, eh? Yes, sir. Extraordinary when you come to think of it, Jeeves. Sir? All these remarkable happenings, don't you know? Sir? Well, if I didn't know better, I think I'd begin to wonder if they'd actually taken place. Really, sir? But, of course, we know that they did. Indubitably, sir. Hmm? Oh, good. So, uh, what are you waiting for, Jeeves? I wondered, sir, um, after your exertions, whether you might care for a whisky and soda. Ha! Ah, oh, uh, splendid. Uh, trot along and fetch it, there's a good fellow. It's here, sir. What? Jeeves, you stand alone. Thank you very much, sir. Jeeves, once more you have stepped forward like the man you are and spread happiness all about. Really, sir, I am exceedingly obliged. No, Jeeves, no. It is I. Who am obliged? You are a marvel. I endeavour to give satisfaction, sir. Production copyright 2002. All rights reserved. The Audio Partners Publishing Corporation is also pleased to be the publisher of more Jeeves humor by P.G. Woodhouse, including Carry On, Jeeves, The Inimitable Jeeves, and How Right You Are, Jeeves. For a free audio editions catalog offering thousands of audiobooks on cassette and compact disc from all major publishers, call toll-free 1-800-231-231. 4261. Visit our website at www.audioeditions.com.